Hey guys, welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. I am your host, Johnny Blackburn, and alongside me this week, as they are every week, my co-hosts, Gary Elmore. And Neil Riley. And this week we are coming to you live from different places around the country. Oh, like yeah. we do every week. Because <laughs> we're all everywhere and it's COVID and we can't meet in one spot. And That's, we live in the 21st century, we so we can do this. Yeah, you know, yeah. Thank, thank God for uh, for portable mics and... You know, Zoom, Zoom calls and the internet yeah. and, and Discord. And well, obviously Al Gore, Discord. thank him for the internet. So. Of course, we have to thank right. Al Gore for the internet because, yeah. you know, that was solely him. I'm sure nobody else helped with that. Um, <laughs> this week, we are very pleased and privileged to welcome to the show um, a critically acclaimed uh, TV and film composer and musician, uh, Jimmy Laval, and critically acclaimed film, TV producer, and uh, former composer and musician, Paul Behan. Gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so this week we are going to be focusing here on soundtracks and scores in film and TV. Uh, we'll be going over uh, underrated and overrated composers, uh, most iconic uh, soundtracks and film scores over the last really some odd decades um, of film. There really is no stone left unturned that we won't go ahead and focus on. Uh, and we are also going to go ahead and try to dig into the minds of, of a film composer and uh, kind of the process that they go through to create the subtle nuances that you appreciate in a film. Because let's face it, without music, you couldn't have an actual movie. You couldn't have an actual show. It would just be strange. Um, I was actually listening to another podcast earlier in the week, and uh, I, I, I do forget the name of the composer, but who the gentleman who composed Psycho, uh, originally Alfred Hitchcock, didn't want to have any music at all for the shower scene, uh, and they I was uh, they they played they played the video portion of mm. the scene with music and without, and I mean obviously, the winner is with the music. Yeah, uh, it's just very awkward, and it doesn't have quite the same level of intensity. You know, mm -hmm. um, of course. Then again, who knows? Still could have been intense back in the. <laughs> Back in that day, I think we're just kind of used to the violence and chaos the, <laughs> that the media throws at us nowadays. Uh, so it's just good fun. Uh, so I do want to go ahead and start off um, with uh, with introductions here. And uh, uh, Jimmy and Paul, if you guys want to give a little uh, background on yourselves, um, while we are familiar with uh, with with your work, uh, we've researched you guys a uh, fair amount here before the show started. Um, but our listeners uh, may or may not be familiar with you. Um, so Jimmy, I did want to start with you. Um, if you want to give us a little background of kind of how you got into the music industry in general, how you got into film composing, and uh, kind of what uh, what you know tickles your fancy with uh, the whole uh, industry as a whole. So, um, yeah, well, uh, let's see. Um, I guess I'm most most uh, commonly known for uh, my role as releasing music as the album Leaf. Um, over the last 20 plus years, um, I've had other bands here and there that uh, um, have had some success too. But um, yeah, the Album Leaf has been my steady project since uh, 1998, some ish, something like that. Um, and the music that I create is pretty, it, primarily instrumental. Um, uh, I had a lot of uh, success in the sync licensing world, um, kind of through the, uh, I guess, the aughts and when kind of. Uh, I mean, going on to this show um, or the subject of this episode, um, kind of when the um, soundtrack uh, sync placement um, music kind of started to shift a little more, uh, I guess, indie and, and independent music and underground bands. And um, so I was a part of that world um, with a lot of syncs and like the OC and um, Suits and Grey's Anatomy and Sons of Anarchy, you know, things like that. Um, and then... You know, uh, like 2010-ish, I basically uh, kind of started to shift into composing film. There was a film that uh, was using a lot of my music, and they had asked for approval in it. Um, and I essentially offered to score that film um, just kind of as out of my own curiosity and out of my own kind of, you know, just wanting to get into that realm of film scoring. And then um, since then, I've done... In the last 10 years, like I've said, I've done 20 films now and, you know, still continue to release music as the album leaf and, um, you know, I've just been in this, I guess, industry and, and, and realm for, you know, the last 
basically, basically since I, before I graduated high school. Um, and then, yeah, here I am on your show. There you go. And, and the big and times. We, the, <laughs> you've reached the pinnacle of where you're going to go. No, I'm totally kidding. Yes. Um, so I, I did have a question about the album when I was when I was, you know, doing my when I was researching uh, you and, and your group. Um, I, I did see that you guys had started in, in 98, if, if, if I'm correct. Um, yeah, it is just I. It's, it's just you. Yeah. OK. It's, yes. Yeah, so you have other uh, you have other musicians that just come on and kind of record. With yeah, you, I, I have a kind of a solid cast of characters that are you know kind of always um involved but uh yeah yeah they change um but they stay solid for a good number of years and then and then they get bored of me <laughs> <laughs> and then on to the next one <laughs> yeah <laughs> on with the show though I'm, I'm sure as as you always think um so so with with the album leaf um you you guys you've been going for for 20 years on this um how how many how many uh, albums have you guys put out since then when i um was originally going and i was listening to some of your music on like spotify and such um i you know i, I saw uh the light uh window uh 2214 and all yes. that um how many how many albums have you guys come out with in the last 20 years uh do you guys also do you have you were, did you do a lot of live performances or are you, are you traveling all around doing a lot of concerts uh, I mean, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've released, uh, phew, how many records? Um, one, two, I guess only six records in the last, uh, is it six? Maybe. Six, yeah. I've released six. However, I've also released, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight or so film scores as the album leaf. Um, I've also released about four or five, six, uh, uh, EPs and, uh -huh. you know, a lot of things, but yes, I've been touring. I've been nonstop touring basically since 1990. Well, right. if we're talking right. album, if only I've been talking, <laughs> I've been basically nonstop touring since, uh, 99 until, you know, basically COVID hit. My last tour was, uh, um, through Europe in, um, September, October of 2019. Um, and that was, yeah, that was the last year. And that was actually a, a 15 year anniversary uh, tour for a record, my first record that I released on Sub Pop um, called In a Safe Place. So when, I mean, that's just, that, that's, that really is astounding. I mean, the, it's very impressive the amount of, the amount of work you've been able to put out in the last 20 years while it seems like juggling a ton of different venues you know going from just the concerts and um and your actual records into the film scores when you're coming up with uh just a little sidebar when you're coming up with with a film score as opposed to your album is there a is there a different thought process uh kind of when you're creating that music or is it is it kind of the same i mean i, I know you said they were using uh one of those movies was using a lot of your old um your old mm -hmm. albums for their film score as it was but kind of just as an as an artist as a composer w is your mindset different when preparing something for a movie as opposed to a record uh absolutely um yeah absolutely i basically you know, I, I obviously I pre I approach each film, um, you know, as a new a, a totally new project. Um, however, I do have just kind of a natural um, kind of sense of tone, sense of you know where my fingers go, how I create music, the sounds I gravitate towards. Um, uh, you know, those components um, are always there, and I've always kind of prided myself on not being a and this is maybe why I haven't had more work, but I've always prided myself on not being a composer that will do whatever you want. You know, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be that person if you want, um, you know, a sound alike of this, or if you want a, you know, if you want a, th this kind of score, you know, if it's out of my wheel, if it's out of my, um, I don't want to say if it's out of my comfort zone, because that's not true. I mean, I'll always push myself and push myself to go further in my own scores. But I mean, if you want something that's just totally out of my league, then or, you know, out of my, you know, natural realm of of umbrella, which is pretty broad. Um, I, you know, I just it's not the right fit, basically. But um, no, if you're an oil painter, we're not going to have you come out here and spray paint something. <laughs> what, what to use? Hey, here's some pastels. Some, go to work. Give me some watercolor <laughs> instead. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, or some dry erase markers or 
that 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 would be impressive if you could mimic yeah. oil, <laughs> mimic oil painting with uh, dry erase <laughs> markers. Um, so, who would you say was who was kind of your your inspiration growing up um, to start? Um, you know, like on the uh, it seems to be the like the electronica style music. Um, you know, just the nice, easy flowing, pure instrumental. Um, at least from what I had listened to. Um, kind of who who was your who's your inspiration? Who'd you you know find yourself listening to the most growing up? I mean, I went through and, and <clears throat> I mean, I went through a lot of different kind of discovery. Um, you know, you, you obviously, you, you're kind of exposed to, um, the mainstream of thing. And my mainstream was, um, uh, like early nineties. So my mainstream then was, <clears throat> you know, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, uh, that kind of stuff, um, around those time, that Seattle time period. Sound, but of yeah. course... Yeah. And of course, at the same time, um, you know, I had my dad's record collection with, you know, the Beatles and Rolling Stones, and Simon and Garfunkel, et cetera, et cetera. And then I had my brother's influence, which was, you know, like Scorpions and Cinderella and um, Rat and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of started to discover things on my own. Um, I, jo- I was in I, I came up in the band and orchestra program in, 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 in school. OK. Yeah. And. Um, through that, I mean, you will be, you would, I mean, yeah, there's so many, <laughs> there's so many I, I, characters, I guess. I was a drummer, so <laughs> there's so many characters in the drum line, you know, that's so I, that, right when I went to ninth grade, I discovered like Sepultura and like Deicide and Cannibal Corpse and, you know, things like that. That's like, that, that was like the kind of um, music that like the drum line was listening to and those, and those guys. So I got into like death metal for a sec, you know, and then also just started discovering just like regular, you know, just punk music and, and, um, getting into those kinds of, um, you know, just kind of peeling the, the layers off of the onion and, um, and then there was a really, and I know that Paul will be able to um, to speak to this too. Um, both also, I bought, I, I would, you know, Paul worked at a at a at a CD uh, record store in in San Diego um, called Music Trader, and I bought a ton of CDs from him all the time um, of um, early electronic bands that uh, that that. And and actually, it kind of goes does go back to this because there was like bands like Tricky and Hoover Phonic and. Um, uh, uh, I can't remember other ones um, off the top of my head, but like that kind of, that kind of, um, you know, genre of stuff. So, but then again, like moving forward to the things that actually influenced me, you know, that was just kind of like discovery. But then I started to like really get um, influenced by things like Aphex Twin and Square Pusher and, and um, Fortet and, um, you know, German electronic, um, more music label, um, uh, Portis head, um, you, you know, um, and at the same time also being influenced by like Nick Drake and Red House Painters and, um, you know, really kind of like intricate guitar playing and open tuning stuff. So that's kind of the blend of the two. Um, and then when I discovered Brian, Eno, it was just over for me, you know, I, that, that was like everything, everything I do has a drone. It's just, there's an atmosphere and every single piece of music that I write and it's always there and it's, you know, just, I can't not, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, or there's space There's just something that creates that like overall general tone. Um, so, I mean, I feel like, um, that, and then discovering, you know, German kraut rock and, and can and craft work and, um, you know, Noi and, um, um, harmonium and, you know, just a lot of like cluster and just a lot of that scene, um, was where I kind of drew a lot of my rhythms from, as well as from hip hop, um, like Trap Called Quest, and and you know, so it was kind of like a very, very, very big umbrella um, that I kind of drew from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 great. It's it's so special when we're able to we finally find that that one that one group or that one person that provides that inspiration for us to go to the next step and makes us realize this is what we want to do for the rest of our lives um yeah absolutely that, yeah um so paul i want to jump over to you really quick um uh, so a lot of uh, i know a lot of your background from what i was seeing was um you had your own uh recording label excuse me 
uh, called Manimal Group, and I, it seems you guys had done some work with like The Cure, David Bowie, Duran Duran, um, and stuff like that. And I know that you had told me that you had also composed um, uh, a good amount of stuff a while back um, within uh, the horror genre. I, th- I think I recall you saying. Um, so yeah, kind of. How did you How did you fall into that? Because uh, it's, it's not like you're both. Uh, you're you were also a musician, right? That's correct. Well, there's a whole backstory involving uh, Jimmy and I. You know, he left out <laughs> oh. a big portion of Sandy, of the San, the San Diego Juicy. school uh-huh. of uh, of musicians. I don't know. Uh-huh. <laughs> there was just, sounds like some drama, <laughs> and I want to hear it. No, <laughs> not no, no. drama. No, it's just like no. an era that is, is so influential was, to to who to who we are, and I think sure. who's, who we still are. You know, to paint a little bit of a picture of it, I mean, you know, after, you know, post Nirvana, I mean, almost literally post Nirvana, like the week after Kurt Cobain passed away, um, San Diego went on everyone's radar as being the next Seattle. And did they, you know, as I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it, it never did. I mean, Blink-182, ironically, weirdly <laughs> enough, it was the only really big band oh, that came out of San Diego. And th- those guys <laughs> were a bunch of dicks from, you know, high school. Uh, but anyways, whatever. <laughs> but Jimmy, you know, Jimmy and, Nailed I, it. Jimmy and I met each other at, uh, I ran a record store when I was about 19 years old. I met Jimmy through my buddy, Gabe Serbian, who Jimmy, uh, God, I can't even name all, Jimmy could tell you all the chronology of the bands. But Jedi Mind Tricks, Steel Tree. Um, so many. That was, yeah. But if, if I describe the sound to you, there's no words to really describe it, but really just like post-punk, post-hardcore was was really a san diego and washington dc thing maybe oakland and portland had a little bit of it but san diego was like the epicenter of it and it, and uh you know all eyes were on san diego for a minute for about a year i think uh so i, I i'm a musician of very limited means i'm i'm not i i only i was only able to really play in bands as a drummer i was a total wannabe guitar player wannabe bass player <laughs> who just could never really just get it you know yeah but i did i played i played in a few hardcore bands with with some of the same people that jimmy had played with in san Uh diego as a drummer but being chronically dissatisfied with a lot of you know what it took to be in a band getting along with other people uh having you know getting having a you know three four five other opinions in the room just was something i never liked so i always aspired to just do music by myself sure um that that being said i also just kind of as a fluke just kind of uh, came upon enough money one day just through my work to start a record label. And that's where kind of, that's kind of where the self-esteem to start composing stuff on my own kicked in. I started, you know, I executive produced the first Bat for Lashes record and the first Warpaint record. And eventually got to work with Yoko Ono and Duran Duran and Moby and, you know, all my heroes at one point and uh, got to work with David Bowie on one project and, showing people I've been making by myself for, you know, for, for a period of time and, uh, naturally composing films, uh, came, came into focus. Yeah, I kind of did it as a, as you know, on, on my spare time. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and so, and it's, it's perfect that you guys both were able to come on together at the same time to provide us this insight because, you know, not only are you both, you know, musicians and composers, you know, you, you both, you know, you're working in the film world, you're, you're a producer, you know, you had your own record label. So we're going to be able to attack this topic from all ends and I can't wait to sink our teeth into it. Um, so I do want to jump in uh, to the first, uh, to the first uh, portion here. Um, so... Uh, oh, well, I, I guess I, I did want to, I did want to plug this. I had a, we had a, a listener ask us to plug this question, um, uh, before I get rolling. Um, they did ask, uh, what advice might you give to aspiring composers and musicians, um, who wanted to break into the industry itself, uh, for either, you know, TV or film commercials, whatever it might be. I fall flat on my face in the advice world <laughs> because I feel and the reason but the reason why is I feel like it is so fucking competitive sure. is it is it's so nuanced it's so it's so like luck of the draw like I and I came up in a in a in an era that I feel is more achievable from from the work that we did and I'd say that because when when Paul and I were roommates, actually, um, and when we and during that time, I think like 
at, in Golden Hill, we paid like, I, th- I, I paid like $85 a month in rent and I had like a 450 square foot room inside a 2200 square foot Victorian or, uh, you know, old Victorian house and gas was a dollar, you know, and, and, <laughs> and you could go out and you could tour and it was you just would, you know, just grind it and you'd sleep in floors and it was like, and you just like thought you put in that hard work. Um, and eventually somehow, you know, we got noticed, I got noticed. I, you know, was, I put out a record that fell in the laps of, fell into the hands of Sigaros and Sigaros brought me on tour. And all of a sudden I was playing in front of, you know, four or 5,000 people, um, and then I signed a sub pop, you know, it's like this whole kind of realm. And I feel like the advice really is to just, I just, just keep like grinding and keep digging it and just keep, yeah. stay true to yourself and just keep at it. Um, but like, I feel like I don't have any, like, well, this is what you need to do. You know, I, I never feel <laughs> like I, ha- I, I never feel like I can say those things because it's so, I can't imagine being a band um, or a musician or a composer, um, starting out fresh in this day and age, um, with all of the things that are available in your face. Um, it's so flooded, it's so saturated and to stand out in that, i just feel like I have no, I, you know, I, how do you do that? I, I don't know. So- um, you know. In, ad- in, in addition to the market being flooded, do you think that in some ways it's easier because you can have a, uh, it's easier to get the, you know, the equipment, um, sort of uh, these at-home sound studios, uh, you know, and, you know, we're doing a podcast here uh, with really not that much equipment that's specialty on equipment. On our end, at least. Yeah, yeah, on, yeah. on our end. Um, yeah, but the internet, I mean, the internet is making that available. Yeah, and that wasn't, game changer. You know, yeah, yeah so, exactly. I mean, do you think that in some respects makes it easier to kind of get out there because you can put yourself out on the internet for people to help, you know, find you and search for you. And when they're looking for new music, or do you think that it's so saturated that even with all those kind of advantages, it's still more of an uphill climb than it was, you know, 20 or 30 years ago? Um, you, well, there is a, a, a huge plus, a huge bonus to, to, um, um, to the, you know, the Spotify's of the world, uh, basically, and YouTube, et cetera. Um, I remember, I mean, it's all, I mean, essentially all started with Napster <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> um, and I remember Napster and I remember playing, I specifically remember playing a show in Chicago and seeing a couple that was like 65 years old um, and was like, and they came up and they were so, like just, and we were playing a shitty dive bar. Like it was kind of an, uh, <laughs> an uh, not even a dive bar. It was a dive bowling out. It's a very like influential, oh, you know, like, very in Chicago. <laughs> but it was called, it was called the Fireside Bowl in Chicago, and it was, you know, it was a fantastic venue. I mean, everybody, it, it was just like you know, memories galore. Everyone has played there. It's you know one of those nostalgic places, but it's a shithole, um, you know. And basically there was this old couple there. They were like 50 in their sixties and they came up afterwards and they were just like, Oh my God, I found you on Napster. And I was like, so happy to, and they brought a shirt. They had conversation, they bought a CD, they bought, you know, all the things. So that was kind of my early influence of like, what the fuck are you guys fighting this? Like this, this everything being available um, model for, you know, cause it's like, those people would not have found a way to find us. Um, and in the end, they liked the music, so they came, they paid money to come see the show. They bought a t-shirt, they bought a this, you know, whatever. So that's, in a sense, you know, money in the band's pocket, in our pocket, thank you very much. And that was because it was available to them. And that's the same kind of model that Spotify, Spotify fucks you. That's, that is for sure. I mean, they do, I mean, they are just, they, they, they just, take so much it's it's so greedy it's not even i I mean it is a fact um now a word from our advertiser spotify (laughs) (laughs) and youtube is worse um you know and i remember being in a i I actually uh, this is i mean the side story was like 
I uh, my publishing company um, had a meeting at the Beverly Hill Hilton or you know whatever the fan, some fancy Beverly Hills whatever um, hotel, and we had a meeting with the the YouTube C F O or something like that, and then a bunch of other YouTube people, minions, whatever you know, just a bunch of other people. Anyways, and the publishing company had myself um this woman morgan kibby who at the time was playing an m83 um and uh, a couple other artists and songwriters and it was basically and our in the head of our publishing company and they basically we were basically having a conversation with the youtube cfo about you know what are you going to do about paying us better and he's like nothing like no we don't we don't you, we we you need us more than we need you like this all you know all kinds of stuff it was just basically a a a a, a giant like fuck you like you are benefiting from from our service and so you know th- that i guess is a side note of how much praise i'm also giving the discovery and the availability um but in the end i mean it's like you know it's it's weighted it's just like you have that part of it and then you have the other part where i think essentially me personally if i like something i find it on vinyl i buy it um or i you know i find some way to support um direct but that's myself and and you know i hope that other people have that kind of in them as well but the discovery is there, you know, it's available, which is great. Spotify suggests other bands, they suggest other artists, they suggest, you know, you can kind of go down this rabbit hole of new music that you would never find sitting in your house, which, you know, was, you know, a playlist is like, is like the, 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 the record store clerk in a sense, you know, like whoever's putting on records in the, in the, in the, in the store, that's what a playlist is in Spotify, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's kind of one of those things where it's, it might even be at this day and age because the market is so saturated. It's just luck of the draw. It's, yeah. if somebody hears you that, you know, they're, they, they actually have some, some pull in the industry or maybe to the next level, you know, you get lucky and you can go. I mean, I'm sure a friend of mine uh, is a uh, actor in New York, been there for a while, um, had, you know, moderate success, I guess. Um, but he's, he had always told me, he's like, you know what, man, I always feel that the greatest actor and actress to ever live have not been discovered yet. And they may never be discovered because they may not know how to get to the next step. They may not get in front of the right people. And by the time they do, it's going to be too late and maybe their Absolutely. willpower has just ran out. So it, it, it might, yeah, you, you might be right. It might just be that look of the draw. So uh, would you say that like modern day talent scouts for uh, bands are more people that kind of sit around and listen to various Spotify artists or I guess today? Yeah. I mean, there's no way to go to a concert or anything, but um, you know, is it <laughs> a recent memory? <laughs> yeah. I mean, is it just sort of, I'm going to listen to a whole bunch of different music and find something I like. And if I do, I'm going to let the record label know about it. I think it's a combination of a handful of things. Cause I mean, I had scored, you know, X amount of films before I actually had an agent. Um, and, um, and before that, I had so many, let's just like underground, you know, I, I'd booked all of our, my early, early tours, like in the nineties and stuff like that. Um, and then through those, you met people along the way. And I think there was like really organic connections back then, um, of basically how things were, um, happening. Um, I just, a lot of people that put on shows from that worked at venues then kind of broke off. Like a lot of booking agents and, and people have like had their starts, um, within, um, you know, establishments or venues or whatever that you're just exposed to, um, you know, bands all the time. Um, but nowadays I do, f- I have no, I don't, I don't know how, 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 a. um, I think it's like a combination of the label, a combination of management, a combination of, you know, whatever your team is, it is assembled behind you to kind of like have those connections. Um, I know that when I, I've changed management, um, four times, four times, four times in my three times uh, whatever i mean the point is is like each time i've changed management the in comes a new team and a new set of opportunities it's a new lawyer a new this a new publicist or a new you know all of those kinds of things a new agent that you know that 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 my manager might work with um all of those things kind of become available and the option is there and it's not a given that they're going to take you um and take and take you on but i also feel like you know in the end it's about connecting um 
like having that agent connect with like, you know, just support you and be your champion and want to kind of like, you know, um, help you out in that, in that journey or whatever. And I think the discovery from the scratch, I know that from my agent, like, but the only thing that I can speak to with that is from my film agent, but basically I had a film that was, you know, opening at Tribeca and he was scrolling through, he saw my name. He was, you know, kind of like, didn't know who I was upon first, um, you know, seeing the film in my name, but then did some research and was a huge fan of the show Scandal, which I had a license, a recurring license on um, for my song, The Light. Um, which became this kind of like underground kind of, um, you know, viral thing with the community that loved that show. Um, and he himself was one of those like, oh my God, I love this song. I love this sync. And then just put it all together and then reached out said, hey, do, do you have a representation? And then, you know, we met and, and here <laughs> we are. And now I have the same, <laughs> I'm in the same agency now, but now it's kind of crazy because like, you know, my agent, I'm with Gorfain Schwartz and Gorfain Schwartz has like John Williams and, like Thomas Newman and, um, you know, just like all of these crazy heavy hitters that, you know, I get, I get kind of, you know, um, I mean, it's great to be in that company, but, um, it's a, it's definitely even more competitive in the film world. I feel than than um, yeah. Anyhow. Yeah, I, I know. And I, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's just with it's probably it's more competitive than it was 20, 30, even 50, 60 years ago um, with today's day and age with just the, the the medium that we have in the Internet and social media, you know, YouTube. Uh, it's just so easy for everybody, uh, but also so hard and challenging at the same time. Uh, Paul, what about you? Um, I guess when you had you said that you had you had come into you had um, you had you know, worked you know, worked your ass off and you had, you know, come into that that amount of money and you were able to start your own record label. Um, how, how would you recommend for somebody who was kind of looking to get into this portion of the industry uh, just based on your own experiences? I'm kind of falling in the same category as Jimmy, um, exactly what he said. I mean, I do get, I get a lot of graduate students or, you know, graduate program students at UCLA or coming at me. You, a lot of them are business students. They, they ask me, you know, everything from, you know, how, how to start a record label to, do you guys <laughs> still make money? How do you make money? How does, and yes, Jimmy, Spotify, they do rip people off left and right. <laughs> um, and I, I, but I still like the folks that are there. Uh, thank you. Oh yeah. That's the funniest thing is it's like, it's such good people to work there and they're, they're great. great. And they're, and they're, and they're, yeah. Like, Didn't you just raise the royalty rate a little bit higher? Yeah. I mean, Apple, Apple does a pretty good job. And they anyways, um, but not their call. I, I, <laughs> I get students, I get, you know, younger people that do come to me. And of course, after about 15 minutes of trying to think of the most cynical, jaded old man answer i want to give them i i do stop and think okay stop it paul you're a, you're a parent you've got children and you you know you gotta you know you gotta answer seriously so i will tell people just literally don't do drugs stay in school uh eat all your lunch go to bed early um and just be a good person and and pray you know i tell people that too i just say just you know just work hard really really just you know I, and it, I, that's probably like the worst question you can ask me because like five or six years ago, I would have told people to just, I would just ignore people and tell people, don't even bother. We'll get a day job. Um, or stick me you know, stick to your day job. Or whatever. <laughs> you know, that being said though, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm in a position where I'm still getting, because I, I do have the record label. It's still active. I still create and produce TV shows and movies. And yes, I still compose um, mostly for fun. You know, a lot of my, my wife will kind of hold me hostage and make me compose music to her film. She's a director. And, uh, so yeah, so I'll, I'll try to be a good sport and actually, uh, listen to people's demos when they send them to me or when people do ask me, how did you do this? So I'll, I'll kind of tell them straight up, just like, think of something original. And yeah, I mean, that's really my answer. Yeah. Just get, just get it out there and just work your ass off. Keep, keep yeah, grinding until you find don't something. Don't be scared of anything. Yeah. You're going to get rejected. It's just going to happen. Yeah. You know, rejection, that's rejection makes me stronger. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, exactly. It's like the know. dating world. It's like, it, yeah, Gary, <laughs> it is like the dating world, I suppose. Uh, you get out what you put in. Yeah, no, for sure, man, absolutely. Um, so, segueing into into uh, our our first major topic here, um, we did kind of want to uh, kind of pick both of y'all's brains uh, under the artistic vision behind scoring a film and a scene for uh, film or TV. Doesn't really matter. Documentary. Um, so. 
Paul, I do want to start with you on this one. Um, are there specific genres in TV or film uh, that are that you guys find that you would find pretty standard to pair with specific genres of music? Like, you know, I know we, we see a lot of times in, in horror movies, you know, a lot of times it's, it's primarily just strings and high, you know, high pitch piano and, yeah, and, and yeah. that's it. Um, is there one in particular that kind of, that kind of sticks out to you that is just very run of the mill stereotypical. Um, that's just kind of how they've been doing it for 50 years. Well, I think there's a certain comfort in uh, and expectations that that go with a certain genre of film. I mean, if you see a, you know, if you see an old love story, an old uh, romantic film, or whatever, of course you're going to hear an orchestral score, you know. But you see one now, it's going to be some Jack Johnson type guy with a ukulele and <laughs> singing in that kind of like muffled voice, you know. I don't know what I'm doing, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, wow, that's kind of, me. <laughs> exactly. I mean, but then you have these. You know, but with a horror film, I, I think for for me, honestly, I I love when something's a bit more, uh, I guess, more of a. I, I like my expectations to be kind of buried, like like the example of what Johnny Greenwood did for There Will Be Blood was fantastic, and even what Sofia Coppola had done with uh, Marie Antoinette, how she used an '80s oh, soundtrack yeah. to a film that took place or a period of the, the late 1700s, and. Uh, using the cure and bow wow wow for the soundtrack was to me, that was genius. It pissed a lot of people off though. Um, I, I do Good. like that. I like when people kind of yank my chain a little bit and go right. and mess with my expectations. Yeah. That so, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's one of the, I think one of the coolest parts about today's day and age is the fact that we see all these stereotypes that have been set up for the last 70 years or so pre 2000 um we're 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 breaking that glass ceiling you know we're we're going out and you're seeing this industry be revolutionized by by all these people like greenwood um and and so forth um uh, jimmy how do, how do you feel about that are you kind of on the same rope as paul that uh, you you appreciate it when somebody throws something really absurd or maybe obscure for that you know that stereotypical genre they just like to change it up i'm just overall just <laughs> I, I I tend to kind of try to navigate how to say. <laughs> um, I just like I I'm so bored with piano and strings. Like just piano and strings. It's the it's the thing. It's the formula. Everybody does it. And I myself have just like not wanted to do it. And I just I I myself have like made a conscious effort to not be um, that composer. Um, I have done it, but. Um, not as a whole, um, but I just feel like, yes, there's a, there's, there is that, um, you know, marriage of film, um, pretty broad, um, and also action with the, I mean, there was a time, when was it like every trailer turned into a Skrillex song or, you know, yeah. <laughs> every action movie turned into a Skrillex song. You go, and just like, it just, you, oh, there's the best. Oh my, yeah, there's this, there was this video going around that was like a, a mock of like a, every film trailer. And it's just like, boom, it's like scary tone. And then like, boom, then like next thing. And it was, it was hilarious. And I have not laughed that hard in a long time, but um, at any rate, like, yeah, I just feel like I get, I mean, obviously I'm like, it, like a good score is just like when it's just outside of the box and it just is like, wow, that is so cool. Whether it's like, chord structure it could be strings and could be piano but it could be the most in, in in like uneasy chord you know like um like um homecoming season two i don't know if you like that that score emil 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 he just he just did it he's 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 coming up right now um that score was so cool like it was just all these really eerie chord structures chord placements um like the instrumentation was more horn like just all, but that was also strings but it was like what was cool and refreshing about it was the chords and the and the and the variations and the you know all of those things so i feel like um you know I was I, going into the scene, you know, just wondering and think doing some research into the, into this episode, I was just thinking like, uh, you know, who's overrated. And, um, I, I looked and somebody said John Williams and it's like, that's so crazy to say because uh, yeah. <laughs> he's done so many different things like all across the board and like people try to like one note him, but at the same time, it's like, 
I just watched Witches of Eastwick last night. I'm like, wait, who scored this? Which John Williams scored Witches of Eastwick? That's crazy. John you Williams know, like, scored he, Witches of Eastwick. I didn't know that. Yes. I would have thought it was like it was Danny like, Elfman or something. And Harry Potter. No, exactly. It was like, and well, it's like there was a time period when there was like so many, like you know, the 80s and 90s. I feel like were all great mm-hmm. and terrible scores. Like it was like yeah. the, the uh, it was like they were either like fantastic. He had like Beverly Hills Cop or like Teen Teen Wolf is a fantastic <laughs> score. Teen, um, <laughs> really things is, like though. that, and then. <laughs> Um, you know, and then you had like all the, your cheesy one note, I don't know, like, um, I, I, I can't even, I don't, I don't know one off the top of my head, but they were good and bad. Um, but I also feel like it was a formula and they, they were trying different things. Cool. Since came into the world. Um, that was cool. Um, but, but yeah, I'm definitely drawn to things when, um, there's like something just new and interesting. And I feel like in the last 10 years, the scoring game has changed immensely and it's really exciting. I wanted to kind of ask both of y'all a question uh, because I recently watched the uh, Dirty Harry movies um, and I noticed a distinct change. I don't know if you guys have seen them or not, but in uh, the first two Dirty Harry movies, which are the early 70s, when you have things like a car chase or, you know, a foot chase, you don't have music going over that. So you just have the, you know, the screeching of the tires, the revving of the engine, you know, people screaming, that kind of thing. And then when you get into the later 70s and going into the 80s, then you start having that music overlaid with the car chases. And I don't know, I I think that sometimes music uh, can almost draw your it depends on how it's used, but it can almost sometimes detract from the scene. And don't get me wrong, I think music really, really can make a scene like anything from Jurassic Park would be a, a good example. But how do you guys feel? Do you think music is sometimes overused in today's movies? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, know, I, know, I know what you guys' business is. So, so you're, you're like, no, you need more music, What's funny but. is like, I, I, I've, I've done so many films where I'm like, oh, there should be no score here. And like, I feel like it's like so certain scenes are so much more powerful when there's no music and you're in it and you're in that moment. Um, and a lot of directors, you know, they're, they, they don't go for it. And I'm like, I, I feel like I'm the composer that like would prefer out of an hour and a half to have like 20 minutes of music or something like mm. um just because i feel like i don't know i mean it, obviously it's it's per film you know like it, it all depends but a lot of times i'll like see a scheme i'm just like oh this is so good dry um like yeah. just it's it's so great and then but that also can lead into how terrible films can be mixed and i think that that um can also ruin just ruin moments as well and ruin scenes because Mm-hmm. you know you like you come out of this thing and the music's just been ripping you a new asshole because it's just blasting in your face and then you can't hear a thing that somebody's saying because they mix the dialogue so you know there's like that whole thing too and then so it's hard to get past that where like you know that situation happens yeah johnny and i had recently seen a movie called tenant where they had uh, yeah, I was wondering about that film, actually. Yeah, it, it, I think it had pretty bad mixing because a it lot of the dialogue... I, I don't, I'm trying to be nice to it. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's so funny yeah. because in, in past podcasts, we haven't been kind to it at all. Oh, so. okay. Uh, and well, I love Chris the, Nolan. The, so the mixing, sad. like you couldn't hear a lot of the dialogue that people were right. saying. And it's um, a very complicated script, so you need to understand the dialogue. But I, I, it almost seems to me like as you said, it really depends on the movie. Like Lord of the Rings, I think really like it had a lot of music to it, but it really went with the story and carried you. Whereas, you know, other times it's like you're just eating too much icing on your cake. And if you just back off of the music, when you do put the music in, it'll really impact you a lot more. Right. Right. Yeah, I agree. I've been really lucky. I, I get to work with, there's this female director named Natalia Pizarro and she's up in comedy. She's done a, a handful of mostly genre type films and mm-hmm. she, her specific instructions for me are literally, she'll, she'll pinch me by the shoulder and say, dude, pack this film with music from beginning to end. <laughs> like there's not Oof. even over the dialogue and that's kind of her style. And I mean, you know, for me, I'm like, sure, I'll do it. You know, no problem. <laughs> um, but I have the opposite problem with other uh, other directors I've worked with. They're just like, you know, 
just sent a couple of little sound things here and there, sound bites, and then compose the beginning and the end. So, anyways, so when, everyone, they're all different. When mm. so when composing a film, then uh, do you, so I, I guess to Paul, then since you're just talking about it, do, do you prefer um, a director or producer? team or whoever the creative team is do you prefer them to be in your ear giving you as much instruction as possible or do you prefer them just lay off and let you do your thing i'm assuming jimmy's probably the opposite but i i literally i will sit there with everything set up with the director watching watching the uh raw footage and composing on the spot i mean there's been a couple instances where i've luckily been lucky enough to just have something ready to go Mm -hmm. but for the most part i'm i'm in the studio with them literally like louder quieter with their, their directors <laughs> directing me. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, I always, I always walk away feeling like I gave it my touch and gave it my everything. I was lucky enough to work with uh, John Taylor from Duran Duran and David Scott Stone, who's been in a zillion bands. DSS. On a, yeah. yeah on, we, we got to do a really experimental uh, art film a couple of years ago and we all sat together. It was the same thing. The director showed up lady and she just was almost kind of belting out orders at me and John and David. And it was like, <laughs> funny, I, I've had a few moments where I was like, Jesus, if someone would have ever told me this as a 10 year old kid in the eighties, like that you'd be working with, you know, these, these people and having somebody who probably was too young to even know who these guys were <laughs> just screaming at us, telling us what to do. <laughs> it, you know, it was quite an experience and it, it worked out beautifully. Yeah. I, I, that's kind of how I work. Jimmy, I'm, I'm assuming you're the complete opposite. <laughs> um, no, I, I actually prefer a mixture of both. I like to put a layer of, I, I like to kind of just have a roadmap of the film. Um, and I can kind of like, kind of just create the textures, create the underscore, kind of just like create the, um, um, uh, just the, the zone. Um, and, uh, I'll get, I mean, I, Typically the way that I've worked, I guess, um, well, I also score, my wife is also a filmmaker and I, and I, and I, and I will work with her. Um, and that's often, um, times where we're like, yeah, she's, you know, we, we, we live together. I work here. She works here. Um, we, she'll come in and we'll watch back and, and go through things. Um, but I guess like basically like the, the, the short version is I benefit and love working with the director in the same room. But after mm-hmm. a certain point, after I've already gotten down my ideas and gotten down my things, and then we kind of fine tune and tweak a scene together. Um, and that's always been my favorite way to do it because it's just, you know, there's been, I've worked with like music editors. So after the fact where I haven't been like in this, in the room when like mixes, like the final mix is happening for a film. And certain things happen where like, I just, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm so picky and, and anal about fades. Um, I mean, I know it sounds crazy and uh, many people don't hear it, but like the way of, of a song fades, the way a cue fades, um, is really important to me. Um, and the way things are cut the way, you know, just all, a lot of stuff. So I feel like being in the same room together and having that, doing the things to, you know, doing, doing those edits on the spot together and, and, and just carving out, um, it's, you know, I, I also scored, I also really scored a picture as well. So I'll, I'll try to hit cuts and like, you know, in, in actual film cuts, you know, when, it's, when, then things are moving, I want to hit those cuts. I would, so, um, there's also like little th- things that like, I didn't see the scene, you know, crescendo into this moment. Um, but the directors wanted that. And so they're right there like, Oh, and then I can just easily make that happen right there. So it's a mixture of both, but I do that in the end, scoring a film is a collaborative process and you're hired. Um, you know, so they're coming to you to both bring what you bring, but also achieve their vision. And so that's a collaborative effort right there. So there needs to be, you know, collaboration in, in, in those moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause we had done a, uh, a 48 hour film, uh, kind of recently and, uh, it was like a buddy cop film. And so we had, uh, a score that we were kind of looking for. And I, I know it's a 48 hour, so it's, you know, on a completely different level than you guys yeah. are working. We just do it for fun. Yeah. yeah. As well. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we gave the guy that was going to score it, um, like, we're like, we want it to sound like Ave Maria, you know, and 
when we got that back, you know, I, I guess, you know, you can't really work with people as closely as you can uh, in a, like an actual full budget kind of movie. But it, you know, it, it feels like maybe we could have given a little bit more direction. So I guess my question is, what kind of notes do you guys, notes, no pun intended, um, <laughs> like uh, as, um, you know, when you're scoring films, do you want the director to just be like, we're looking for a really powerful score here that will pump up the audience or do you like more like we want staccato notes that are quick and you know successive like what kind of level of direction do you guys generally like um i i i you know the filmmakers so so i'm lucky with my wife she trusts me completely um and i see her early cuts and i see um um, I, I know what her, she does documentary too. So that's a whole nother like world of, of, of talking about how to score a film. Um, it's so different than narrative. Um, but so, cause the documentary is ever changing. There's no script, there's no storyline, there's no any, you know, you know, it's like you only have the footage that you have, what, what you caught from the character, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. With her, I get to just kind of know what she's making a film about. And I just create a, bed of music i just create a library of of cues and then essentially with that it then i then hand it to her editor and her editor will basically start to place all of my cues um in those places and then and then from that i get to fine tune and and kind of carve out you know to the to the scene mm -hmm. um with narrative i often get a lot of um films with temp um with temp scores and and often i ignore it i just i, I kind of like know the zone and then the what they're kind of going for, but I will ignore all direction from um, th that temp score and just kind of create my own thing um, based on the based on the vibe or the mood <clears throat> of the temp score. Um, and sometimes it's my own music as a temp score, so that's a little funny too. Just kind of like recreate myself and just kind of like you know. Um, but also with that being said, I can kind of just, you know, create a cohesive, you know, um, palette, um, based on kind of like, in luckily, like I've also worked with filmmakers, um, you know, on a repetitive basis. So there's a lot of trust involved. Um, and I, and I think that's really important for me. They trust me, um, to, you know, create something that is going to resonate with them. And then in the end, it does come down to that collaboration of being in the same room together um, and kind of fine tuning and carving out the, the details. Okay. And uh, uh, Paul, how about you? Well, I think that everything I've done so far has been, everything I've, I've been summoned to do has been mainly because of my influences. And I mean, somebody's looking for something very specific that I've already done on, you know, tracks that I've just kind of put out through my label of, of, that I've actually composed or performed on. I get very specific instructions, you know, I think that my, my only somewhat recipe, if I had to have one or had to really say one that I'm kind of known for is just the, the cross between the minimalist John Carpenter, you know, meets like some, whatever <laughs> Angelino uh, Benamantelli did for Twin Peaks. And that's kind of like, if someone's looking for that, like really simple kind of cheesy synth strings that are like a throwback to like, uh, you know, something like on a Mellotron or something like that they'll come to me about it. Usually they're not coming to me for an orchestral score or, you know, something that's like some mind blowing ambient music that's done on the most, you know, amazing equipment. That's just, you know, just showed at um, the trade shows last week. You know, I think that there's <laughs> something very specific they're looking for when they do come to me. You know, it's not like, I, I mean, as much as I wish I could just be like, yeah, there's a, I can do a whole entire orchestral score for you. It's, you know, it's not, and that's never the case. It's always something very, okay, you, this, this thing you did was really creepy. Can you do that for my film? Like make it even creepier than what you did for that other film. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what it is. And I mean, the, the, I think only one time I was actually able to really scare myself where it actually, uh, frightened. My wife was really frightened too. She was like, I have to turn this off. This is really scaring me. Um, <laughs> nice. Are, are you the man I married? Was, no. <laughs> seriously. Like that's, that's like, to me, that was the ultimate compliment too. It was like, this shit really scared me. And I, I, now I'm just looking to outdo myself every time. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's gotta be, that's gotta be tiring. 
<laughs> well, oh, always it's, looking it's, to, to one up yourself every single time you got to do a project. <laughs> the only goal I have left. <laughs> That's right, man. Yeah, you're already at the you're already at the top. Right? Only only way to go is up. Um, <laughs> so and, and so that jumps in, kind of jumps into our next question. Um, we originally I was going to ask, you know, how do you guys decide what genre of music and what instruments to use for a film or scene? But it sounds like from the way you guys are both talking, um, and forgive my ignorance on this, I you know I've never composed any type of score at all. Um, it sounds like you guys kind of just you stick to uh, your home base. You kind of stick to what you're known for and you don't branch out much. And if I'm incorrect, please, please do correct me. Um, do you guys find yourself? Do you guys find yourself branching? Like if um, so, like uh, Paul, uh, Paul, you said you did a lot of uh, minimalist things. Have you ever attempted to compose um, like maybe a, I don't know, from like the jazz genre? I don't know. Or um, uh, old classic rock or something like that for, um, for a salty film. limerick, maybe. Yeah. Or I, maybe I don't, more have, I don't have the chops. I don't have the musical chops for that, really. I mean, I, okay. I, I just, I've got very limited abilities, but, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to, when, when it comes to sampling or making, uh, you know, synth synthesized noises and sounds, and also I, I do collect a lot of field recordings, like that's kind of been my thing. Oh, okay. and I just moved to the beach recently. So now I'm like oh, really nice. excited to start going out there and recording the waves. And yeah, but previous, I, I've been living amongst nature for last maybe five or six years after years and years of being downtown uh -huh. so a lot of field recordings are kind of like I, I look forward to using more uh I, I guess like orchestrated uh nature sounds and i, I call them foundscapes yeah. foundscapes okay now nice. is that a, is That's... that a term coined by you or or an actual yes. term in the industry okay very no, I, nice i made that up i made it up about 10 years ago Nice. Okay. Well, hey, folks, you heard it here first, and I don't give a flick. You, that's why people listen into this podcast. Soundscapes, to, copyright. To, yeah. Well, Boom. you can't copyright it. It's his copyright. Right. I'm saying, stop, I'm stop saying it's copyrighted ideas. for Get him. Get the hell out of here. I have copyrighted it for you. I bless you with the copyright. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jimmy, how about Jimmy? How about you? Uh, do you find yourself um, veering away from um, your original stomping grounds ever, or do you kind of you kind of just stick to the same you know instrumental um, I, uh, building I blocks that got you there? I used to. Um, I think earlier when I was more hungry, and or, I'm not I'm not hungry. Um, still hungry, but earlier when I was um, more like um, kind of coming up, I guess, and like doing early documentaries and and stuff like that. So I, there was one, the very first film that I scored, um, with that uh, had a lot of. I ba I did a lot of sound alike. You know, I did a lot of like. Um, and and that was also good because um you just you learn a lot from that you learn a lot production wise you learn a lot you know just kind of like what you and and i and i and i am you know a, a a um i play guitar i play bass i play drums i you know i'm a multi-instrumentalist and i play most things on my records and um and so i i i have done like like heart songs and, and, um, like La Tigra sound alikes and, and, um, you know, things like, things like that. And th this was a long time ago. I did do them. And then after that was kind of when I was like, I never want to do that. That's not like the <laughs> composer I want to be. I don't want to be the, Oh, you want, you need a, this. Oh, okay. I gotcha. You know, like come to my like toolbox. You know, I, I don't want to, I never wanted to do that. Um, so I was on a, I was on a TV show. Um, I scored a pilot, the pilot got picked up, um, and it was not my thing at all. Um, but I really tried and I really tried to push, push it. And, um, the pilot got picked up. The process of scoring that pilot was super, super chill, super easy. Just, I mean, I wouldn't say easy, but it was just like really just low stress, just really easy. Like the team got together. Great. And then once the series got picked up, um, I started to score the second episode and the third episode and the fourth episode. And I think that they realized that the show really wasn't, they didn't give it enough budget to kind of really make it hit the way that they wanted it to hit. So the, they couldn't really change what they filmed, what they, what they could change though was the music. Um, and they kind of dropped it on me at last on the last minute. And at this point I was in a position where I was, I should have been a composer that had a team. I should have had, you know, like my X, Y, and Z team and that, you know, I'll take 30 minutes of, or, you know, the, the main 30 minutes and parcel off the rest, something like that. 
Um, so I just like got swallowed up in the process and they all of a sudden just like I'd scored three episodes um, that hadn't aired yet and, and the show hadn't even aired yet. And at the last minute, they just changed everything on me and I just drowned. And I was like trying my heart like they wanted. They just started throwing all these different genres at me like, oh, what what about this? Like, try the guitar thing, try this thing. And I just like, I just could, you know, I just did not, I couldn't, couldn't cut it. And I did not want to cut it. Like I was like trying. I'm like, this is not what I want to do. And eventually I got fired. Um, and my, my agent said, congratulations, you're officially a composer because you got fired. So whatever that <laughs> means. Um, but I was like, cool. I mean, I got, you know, it was a, it was a, it was, it was a good thing that I, that I'm not, that I wasn't on that show. I didn't continue on that show. My pilot I scored still aired, but anyhow. Um, so going back to that, it's like, yeah, I don't want to, I just, I, I, I scored a, I also scored a comedy film called the fuck it list. Um, <laughs> and it just came out actually during the pandemic. Um, and on, it's on Netflix. Um, and that was tough for me because it was a somewhat coming of age comedy, um, teen comedy, um, uh, but, um, super privileged situation, um, too, that was kind of, you know, kind of just morally deaf, um, a, a little bit. Um, but, um, yeah, I just said that. Sorry. Um, anyhow, um, <laughs> <It's okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, basically like it was tough. It was really tough to like do that film. It was like really pushing me in a direction where I had to do like comedy, like, like, like drum set bass, like almost think like Seinfeld, like, you know, like not, not, not that, but yeah, but just definitely like the, like, I don't know, almost like your eighties, almost like your eighties score where it's like, you know, just kind of like this weird, like, don't, 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 don't or like they're looking around they're trying to find something what are you gonna get where are you gonna go in like that that like i i can hear the score perfect i for some reason i i think of the teen wolf scene when he's changing into a a werewolf for the first time (laughs) yeah yeah Um, but like like, it was like i felt like i had to do a score of all that but it was really tough um so again like i'll push myself and i'll go out of my comfort zone to a degree but in the end like i really think that i you're gonna get the best work out of me with what i do and letting me expand on the palette that what of what i do because i can go broad but i can still stay in my my realm right so it's like if somebody came to to either one of you guys and was like hey come do a comedy or hey do an epic adventure or something like that you you guys probably like yeah i mean you know i could but it's it's not it's not it's you're, this the, the kind of music we do is just that's not my wheelhouse that's not what I I I built my my name on you know it's 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 kind of like one of that do you guys feel like most composers in the industry are like that even composers as big as as John Williams or Hans Zimmer Danny Elfman whatever um, do you guys kind of feel that they they fall into that I mean I'm sure they're approached by tons of different agents for different uh, scripts and different producers for different films uh, that they have to turn down all the time. It's a nice uh, problem to have. I, I bet it is. Yeah, I, I bet it is. Uh, <laughs> Let me tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we were having clients come at us left and right like that. <laughs> wish I could turn down. I mean, projects. personally for great. me, I feel like, I feel like if, if the script is good, the team is good and the film is something out of my comfort zone, I'm gonna, I'm gonna want to give it a shot. So, okay. And when I don't want to give it a shot in my, in, in under my, you know, under my umbrella. Um, sure. but you know, but, but I'd be open to it, I guess. Right. Right. How about you, Paul? I like the idea. Like if I was ever approached to, to oversee a score for something like that, where it would be, I mean, it wouldn't be me playing guitar and then playing, laying a bass track and then laying a drum track. It wouldn't necessarily do that. I mean, it would, it would just probably wouldn't, be a uh, it'd be subpar if i did it like that but i think the, and this is how i've kind of done it um in other instances like for commercial work where i just get a bunch of really broke musicians that are actually t- kind of talented and just put them in a studio and then i just fucking scream at them and tell them what to do exactly <laughs> how to do it and i'll you know educate them a little bit spend like a few hours playing like the first two cure records or something and and then just kind of scream at them and just make them perform pay them pay them their day rates and and put my name on it. I mean, that's really, <laughs> there that, you go. that's my plan. If I got it like yeah, a wrong. I mean, call, let's be real. That's essentially what Hans Zimmer and John Williams and people, famous yeah. composers have been doing for me. That's, that's the industry, baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it ain't all sunshine Mark and Mothers rainbows, Bob, motherfuckers. Elfin, go to a guitar center. 
Go to a guitar center and just start picking up people in your truck and bring them to the studio. <laughs> There's a guy that works for Hans Zimmer that sits in a closet and just puts in a thump on the on the one. He just puts just the sit- kick drum down. That's it. He yeah. just goes through a whole film and just puts a kick drum in. So let me let me ask I you to this because I've I've always been kind of curious in terms of people that write music. Uh, does it just kind of where do you hear the sound? I guess because I I I don't write music and I don't I I can't like just come up with a new beat or a new sound or anything. So how do you guys, like, does that just kind of come to you like an Amadeus when he's just sitting there in the bed? Yeah, what's your tra- like what's how your I imagine process? it to people that have that talent? I, I have music in my head constantly and dialogue in my head constantly. Um, and every night when I, when I try to go to sleep, I lay down and I actually like just start coming up with all kinds of ideas. And that's when I, I have to bust out the old laptop and the headphones and I just start to put down very simple structures of what I'm hearing in my head. And then those just kind of sit for months and months and months until they become something until I get a little bit more clarity and go back and revisit those thoughts. That's usually my process. I mean, the, you know, that that's even, even if I can't play it properly, I hear it and I write it. You right. know what I mean? If that makes sense. Okay. So you get kind of Definitely. like the, the, the bare bones of it and then you can oh, yeah. water it later and make it grow. Yeah. If needed. Just, do a simple piano version of something and then just let it sit and marinate for a bit and then really come up with all the rest of the parts and put it together and either hire other musicians to come in and do it for me. Or sometimes if I'm, I can't afford to hire musicians or if I'm just going to just kind of do it, I, I end up just kind of doing it myself. But it takes, it takes me, a, I've, I've, I've seen Jimmy working before. I, I've been going back to when he was a kid and, and uh, he can play, he can play every instrument. He's, he mm-hmm. puts most people to shame. So you know, that kind of God given talent that Jimmy Lavelle has. I mean, like he, he could put, he could do it all himself. For me, it's a different process because I don't, I can't just sit at a piano and put together something that's, you know, mm. sophisticated, uh, as sophisticated <laughs> as Jimmy. I can, I can get the moods off of some simple, simple, simple notes. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I play, a, you know, the piano very badly. And so yeah, it's uh, pretty, it's pretty bad. Thank I've you. Heard you thank you. And like the, yeah, the pinning whistle I've now. been working yeah, on, just, just um, try another profession. <laughs> so do you guys, I, I guess, do you guys ever use um, like the music generation programs where you can just say, I want to have a horn play an F sharp here. And you just kind of write the music on there and then have the computer play it. Or do you always use uh, real people playing real instruments? Definitely not. I mean, me, no, I mean, it's, you have those tools available. I mean, um, and they're, they're extremely common. There's companies that are based solely off of samples, sample libraries and, you know, VSTs, virtual instruments. Um, and that's for me, a useful tool for writing. Um, if I have the budget, I will go back and have those, um, retract um with a with an actual human player yeah Um, Mm -hmm. but if i don't then i just make it sound as good as i possibly could or i use it for its its worth like what i can get out of it like i'm not going to try to get anything more out of it and i'm Mm -hmm. and i'm just going to know that that's what it's giving me and i'm going to try to make that sound as well you know as good there's a score that i did um for one of my wife's films called artist and mother and it's orchestral um here and there and just you know it's all over the place but there's strings and there's and there's um you know horns and all kinds of stuff but it's um it's all vst and i almost and i'm very proud of it in in the sense of like i want it to be an example of what is a a, what is what you can do you know um Mm. but there's still things that you just cannot get that you can't get, you can only get from a human player. Yep. Um, and which, yeah, my last score, um, synchronic, um, is a good example of that. Just there's a lot of the performances I got from the cellists and the, and the violinists, um, you know, specifically were gold, you know, in, in the, in the, mm-hmm. in the outcome. Yeah. You can't um, fake that kind of stuff. No, you can't. not at all. It's not, at it's all. a difference between, I, I mean, I've, I've used tons and tons of um, software instruments. I mean, just like pads and, you know, synth pads and, and then going to, as I'll mention again, da- uh, David Scott Stone's studio where he's got 
it's literally a library of vintage analog synthesizers. I mean, you know, some of the earliest Moogs and modulators he's put together himself. And, you know, like you can clearly hear the difference whenever I've composed anything using his library. I mean, using his actual, you know, vintage keyboards versus the plugin uh, yeah. software instruments. I mean, it's, there's, there's a whole different dimension to using the real thing versus sometimes I have to use those plugins. Sometimes I can't use a, you know, I can't go buy a vintage Mellotron from 1967. I have to use the, the software that it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, even some of those uh, virtual drummers, there's one I, I just used or just played with a, f a few weeks ago called, it's called Krautrock. And it was a drummer and it was actually incredible. I was like, wow, this is actually great. And he actually followed it. Uh, Apple garage oh, band. Okay. It was, it was called crowd rock. I was just fucking with it uh, <laughs> a few weeks ago. And it actually reminded me of go, go, go Earhart a little bit. It was weird. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Would there ever be a, like if you were writing a sci-fi uh, song or a score for that or like with robots or something that you might use you know those uh, artificial sounds or do you would would you always prefer to have people if you had the budget for it um for for me i'm big into synth sound creation so i um a lot of so the synthesizer game has gone full circle um in my opinion uh, basically like everything that was great about 60s and early vintage synthesizers is now being recreated um in modern synthesis um modern synthesizers are incredible um and so powerful and um the my favorite thing about them about this specific these couple keyboards that i have have initialized patches where basically you just you, you, you essentially start with one oscillator a single a single a single waveform um and then you can then kind of you know start to shape your sound um off of that single waveform um it's kind of hard for me to explain it's a lot easier for me to just do it on the fly but you, you hit a button and you basically get you know, just like a, a tone and then you send that tone through a filter. So it goes from and to, you know, just starts to kind of soften or you can make it grittier and then you send that to an LFO and then you send that to this and then you kind of start to get like, ring, 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 you know, just you basically like build sounds from scratch. Um, your, own, your own trademark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what I do. Like, you know, um, kind of on a daily basis, I basically just create synth sounds from, from scratch. Um, and that's what I thrive off of. And um, I use, you know, mostly all my studio is all hardware. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously I have, you know, digital um, things available to me, um, but it's mostly effects and things like that, that I digital that I use digitally, but mostly for all of me, it's all analog gear that I control um, either via MIDI or just, you know, with my, with just hands on myself. Um, but yeah, I, I get excited from, creating sounds from scratch so mm. um but then again i mean it's really about what my ear gravitates toward i could be like scrolling through libraries or vsts and just hear something and then boom that inspires something and it sounds really cool and then i take it and i tweak it and i manipulate it i sample it i redo this i pitch it i you know just like i have a process of kind of just creating sound um and multi-layered steps where i can't even realize or hear where it came from and i just you know I go back to what it originally started as like whoa um so yeah um, okay. yeah. would you both agree right here and right now that the best moment of the synthesized sound was from revenge of the nerds at the end when they're playing the band. <laughs> I don't think you'll find a better example of that anywhere. I'm oh sure. Maybe. I'm sure if we search. My for memory is not serving me, so I'll. Oh. I'll I could. Where, where, Did you remember the song show at the very end? Playing this song. <laughs> <laughs> my, it's been my, so long since I've seen that movie. I'm, likewise, my, my 10 year old son just asked me recently, he's like, Dad, what's Revenge of the Nerds? And I said, hmm. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what funny, a funny thing for me, too, that I've, that I've realized in, 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 in this process is that I, I feel like up until 2009 or 2010, I did not know that there was a composer in the world. Like, I just didn't know. Like, it just wasn't resonating with me. I just didn't think that there's a person that makes music for movies. 
I don't know why. I didn't know. I just watched movies being like, that's cool. Music's cool. I didn't think, who's making that? What do they do? It's kind of weird. I, and, I, and I trip out on that all the time because I'm like, at some point, I didn't even think about it. I just never thought about it. And I think that's like why the previous 10 years when I was having a successful sync run, I just didn't think about compose. I don't know. It was, it's so weird. Uh, um, I, I knew Danny Elfman. I knew that kind of stuff, but I just didn't like, it didn't resonate with me in that kind of sense, which was a really strange thing for me to think about. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, when a movie I think is doing what it needs to do, all the parts work True. together. So you shouldn't even, you know, be thinking about that. But as you know, you, you come to understand and appreciate a little bit more the, the artwork that goes into making a movie, you know, you can kind of start picking those things out. Like I'm sure you guys, when you listen to any kind of music, you appreciate it on a much deeper level than I do because you understand the mathematics of the music better and how the right. notes flow into each other. And I'm just like, Oh yeah, I really like, you know, Duran Duran or whatever. Um, and you guys really you know, like can like, appreciate it on you understand intellectual why level. it's good right we just listen to it and we're like yeah, yeah. that's that's very pleasant yeah like i, mean, I, like, I could see yeah miss bagley it. and miss jones in high school tried to teach me the best they could on music <laughs> but uh and they feel yeah. and they're no longer teaching there anymore so of course it's been quite <laughs> it's some been time. like 20 years so yeah <laughs> it's been it's been a while it's been a while um so moving into uh moving into our, our, our next section here uh we did not want to run out of time and forget to talk about um, the we want to talk about the most overrated, underrated composers of all time, mm. uh, underrated scores and soundtracks, uh, who even who the who you guys think would be the most influential uh, scores, soundtracks of all time. I know we all have our favorites. Um, so let's let's leave the let's leave the door wide open. There is no there's obviously no wrong answer. Um, you know, even if it's a sense of nostalgia that makes you pick something. Randy Newman. Just no. <laughs> Hey, Toy Story. Hey, come on. Hey, what? I love the Toy Story soundtrack. Come on. You I was... got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. All right. Hey, just make... All right. Stop. <laughs> make me sing it all night. Um, Tom, Thomas Newman is incredible. Thomas Newman is also incredible. I was, yes. um, when I was looking up uh, some of the most underrated uh, composers of all time, his name was popping up left and right on a ton of the blogs and um, podcasts that I was listening to over the last couple of days. Um, so let's just, that's perfect. Actually, let's, let's jump into that. Um, Jimmy, I will, uh, I'll start with you. Uh, um, can you give us uh, one or two, uh, uh, composers that you feel are severely underrated. It can be somebody that's been around for a long time, somebody that, um, has passed on, uh, or somebody that's up and coming. Um, who do you think who jumps out, who jumps to mind? Um, un so underrated, I guess it, uh, it's tough because um, I do feel like so many composers are getting their moment and I don't really know about any. Um, so like composers that I felt like might've been underrated are now coming up. Like they're getting, they're, they're getting there. So um, I don't know. People that I think are not talked about enough, maybe. Yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, what is his name? Michael, what is his name? Michael, Michael Abels, I believe. Um, composer for Get Out and Us. Um, yes. Those, okay. yes. Oh my God, those are terrifying. Like, it's just that those films are so good and the music is so good. Um, and, you know, I want to see him. I want to see what he does next. Um, I think he's fantastic. Um, also, maybe underrated. Um, maybe, uh, man. Um, how I, I, I guess, yeah. Cause it's hard because it's like, are they underrated or are they just not talked about? I guess they're maybe not talked about. Maybe they're I just not in the, like, they're in the, the like, same category the, for sure. Yeah. Because like Cliff Martinez has done so many amazing, incredible scores. He's one of my favorite composers and especially drive. drive I mean, drive is drive incredible. Is, yeah. Drive is incredible for both its soundtrack and for its co and its score. Um, and also Cliff, one of my favorite Cliff Martinez things is, um, the Nick. Um, cause I felt like the score, that was like one of the first times where, and it's only happened to a handful. I mean, well, it happens, I, Paul, you, you mentioned one earlier where it's like, you just don't think that that's going to be the music for that show or for that film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Nick was that it was really, really cool. Um, another thing like Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross for Watchmen, like that, that, that score is incredible, um, as well. And I felt like 
that was so out of left field too. Like it just, I mean, it's them. It's like, it's their sound. It's what they do. But for that show, it just like the connection was like, that's, that was a risk, you know? Um, those themes are so strong. Um, Lovecraft country, the composer for Lovecraft country. I don't know his name. Um, also, you know, should be in the mix. Um, uh, Isn't that you? I, <laughs> <laughs> I had a stink in it. I did have a song in it. Yes, um, I think that was the Lord, composer. Uh, the composer overall. Oh, okay. What, what was it? Uh, Laura Cartman, I think, is what. Uh, yeah, in, that's right. That's right. Was telling me. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that is a fantastic um, score. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, oh, those are all fantastic. And it's funny because yeah. we we look we look at all of these we look at all these iconic songs and you know, Gary had brought up Jurassic Park earlier. Mm-hmm. You know, we think of star Wars and we uh, immediately you jump to John Williams, yeah. you know, Jaws, um, Superman. Yeah. Exactly. Which is, which is of Eastwick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which is of Eastwick. And that's, one, that's, see, that's even, what, he, he never ceases to amaze me. I didn't know that. I've seen that movie at least half a dozen times. Or I didn't know it I until last night that. myself. I was just yeah. like, we watched it and I was like, who scored this? What John? Jesus. What has he not me? done? <laughs> what Home has alone? he not done? You know, um, and you look at, I mean, yeah, and uh, I, who else would be even considered a peer of his? I don't know. Hans Zimmer, you know, he did a Gladiator, Inception, any Christopher Nolan movie, yeah. basically. Well, I mean, I, I think we all agree probably Ranking. that uh, John Williams is the gold standard for film composers. I He's the agree. first superstar besides, besides Henry Mancini, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. Bernard Herrmann, too. I think oh, yeah. you referred to yeah. right, right in the yeah. beginning. Mancini, of yeah, Mancini in particular. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I mean, for, I guess, the layman like me, I would say he's the gold standard. I, I don't know, like, the intricacies of, like, oh, you know, somebody else's music is maybe more clever and how it moves from phrase to yeah. um, fortissimo. I'm going to just throw out words that I don't really know. He's and, just done uh, so many just big Just try and budget. sound smart, yeah. He's just done if so many got, if, big If you ask my 76-year-old mother, like, name three film composers, the only one she could probably say is John Williams. Yeah, okay. maybe. Yeah. yeah, I mean, as far as being a superstar, like he's right. like the Spielberg of scoring yeah, films. Well, surrounded by groupies, you know, doing blow. John <laughs> oh. Williams. <laughs> I, yeah, John Williams. Does, yeah. does he strike you as the kind of his music uh, certainly implies that he uh, leads that rock star seventies lifestyle? Obviously, um, I, I I think that's that is to speak to Jimmy's point. That is that is kind of the problem. Is we only know a few. You know, we only know a few of these composers, mm-hmm. and when we see a movie, we hear the music, and we're really interested in it. We're really intrigued by it. I mm-hmm. mean, music, I think we can all agree, in a film, it it tells us what to feel, you know? Um, they even say at the beginning, like I was talking about Psycho <clears throat> earlier, yeah. if you listen to, you can ask, hell, ask any uh, film professor mm-hmm. at any college, and they'll tell you that if you watch the first, you know, five minutes of that score with the opening credit sequence in Psycho, it tells you the entire movie. Mm-hmm. within that song right uh, you know and it, it's it's just it's sad that we we don't know a lot of these people um i mean jimmy you were you were listing off a bunch of names and i was like man i've only heard of like two of those people and i was typing them in here and i was just like oh i was like okay well yeah no, I've, I've heard of that i've heard of that oh wow, yeah did, like you know I the film you just don't know the name exactly. right yeah yeah, when yeah. The, the music in a film really can give it its soul like if you don't have the right sound for the film it's not going to have you know, the thing that moves you as a human being right. quite as much. Exactly. If, I mean, if the, if the music is wrong, if it's, yeah. if it's completely, if it's completely fucked Even up if it's just off a little it. bit, it can really, yeah. you know, throw how you're feeling off. Exactly. And, you know, it throws off how you interpret the rest of the film itself. Right. You, know? you know, it can detract or add to the scene. You know, yeah. it, it's Precisely. really super and that, that's, important. And that's what it's for. Um, and so, so, so Paul, over to you. Uh, who do you, who do you think who would kind of fall into your list of most well, underrated composers? I actually time? wrote a list out so I wouldn't forget. Oh, yeah. I, I, knew, <laughs> I knew if you asked me on the spot, I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but, a man after my heart. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, actually the, the, the soundtrack of Vox Lux that was done by Scott Walker, rest his soul in uh, Sia. She oh, did wow. all the pop songs for it. There's that movie with Natalie Portman where she plays a pop singer. And uh, Sia did all the pop songs. And then Scott Walker, this was the last thing he, the last thing we know that he composed was the orchestral score to the film. And it's a really intense film about a kind of like a Lady Gaga type pop singer who's like really kind of going out on the limb. Um, she's, she's kind of, uh, she's, she's kind of going through some personal internal crisis. And that's number one on my list. I think that that's as far as being underrated. Scott Walker uh, 
composed quite a few films and he's known for so many other different genres of music. But that was one particularly got to me because I, I really wish that film got more attention, especially for the soundtrack. But Johan Johansson, I mean, his work on Mandy and Arrival, uh, Arrival especially, it was just so special. And he's no longer with us, which is really sad because he was young and just had such a promising career. And then uh, another one, the really obscure one that I put on my list was um, Jocelyn Pook. She did the theme from Eyes Wide Shut. The, oh, the, did she? the orgy scene the scene in the you know with the illuminati people having that right. orgy whatever the hell that thing was that that scene and that that music really really affected me in a way i mean that came out like what 99 2000 mm-hmm. and yeah, 99. i just i i've been uh listening to some of her stuff and it's a lot of it's a bit new agey but that one particular track is just so haunting and then Last on my list for underrated though is is got to be Ryushi Sakamoto. He's right, you know, he's <clears throat> one of the greatest. I mean, he he did get some a critical acclaim for Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence and I think he worked with David Byrne on The Last Emperor, but he's done a I mean probably two dozen other soundtracks to these films that are just genius and nobody's heard of them. So, yeah, underrated. <laughs> God, and, yeah, and I agree. I, I didn't even think about that because he's in my wheelhouse. Like I, I, I know him normally. You know, not not as a friend, but like Sakamoto. Yeah, yeah. Sakamoto. Just and I don't know him as a friend, but I know his work. Um, and and uh, so again, it's like it's hard to think of like, uh, and Johan too. Johan was actually a friend of mine. Um, but and he he's sense. on my list for something else. Um, uh, that 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 you were asking, but um, because. Anyhow, yeah, um, Ryoshi Sakamoto, Sakamoto is 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 incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Gary, how about you? Uh, for underrated, um, I put uh, uh, Alexander Courage and Jerry Goldsmith. Uh, they you think are, Goldsmith is underrated? Really? Uh, well, you know, I mean, like uh, I, I love I, him. I just think yeah. he's kind of just standard. Like he's in that tier yeah. two when I kind of think of composers. Kind, kind of my problem was like if I if they're not in those high tiers, I don't even know them. Gotcha. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I, I really, they're the ones that did the, uh, composition for Star Trek, um, right. the original series and the next generation with Goldsmith. Um, and I, I thought that was a really good, uh, composition for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I put them on my list. Oh, very nice. there's yeah. a handful of eighties composers or eighties, nineties composers that did so much that are still working. Is, is Goldsmith? No, he's, he's pay, he passed, but, um, like uh uh alan silverstary or Sil- silver sea is that yes, what, back to the future thing? which oh, I yeah, think yeah. back to the future he's still he's still killing it he's mm-hmm. like still working and and um um like yeah, there's and others I, and like i think yeah i mean hans zimmer obviously goes all the way back to to that yeah. too mm-hmm. um because i but, would actually say that the back to the future theme is probably the best theme song for any movie like just oh, yeah as, the one piece of song because I think that it hits on all the beats, all the emotional beats that you have in the movie. You know, it's got fun and adventure. It's got drama. It's got sorrow and just that the theme song. And I think that is the perfect song for the movie. Yeah. And yeah. Sense I, of wonder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He, I want to say he did. He didn't he do like an Avengers or something like that um, as of now. Like he did something yes. big ish in the superhero world lately and and it 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 just sounded it, it sounded like back to the future to me and i was like who did who oh, i was like oh that's what it is <laughs> um same um yeah he did something um he did he did one of the like in game or in i don't know it's not one of those things but um yeah those themes like he, he has great themes mm-hmm I, I did have another underrated, uh, uh, Jeremy soul. I had to look up who that was. Uh, he's the guy that composed the music for Skyrim, which, uh, was a, the, a video game, but I think that uh-huh. it really, I, I don't know if you guys have listened to that music, but it's really oh. interesting and unique music. And it's, it does a great job of sounding like a different culture, a different civilization. Oh, yeah. Okay. The Elder Scrolls. Yeah. Yeah. From yeah, the yeah, Elder yeah, Scrolls. I, I know. That is a whole nother world. Yeah. Video that's game a composer. whole other yeah. world. Yeah. Say, video, <laughs> video game. That's, I'm sure that's another, that's another podcast for another time. I know people are killing it there. And I'm like, how do you die? I didn't know how to start. I have no clue how to do that. 
Yeah, it's crazy. especially going back into the 80s with like Norbu Umetsu who did the Final Fantasy. Mm-hmm. Like you're talking, oh, yeah. you know, eight and 16 bit sound and trying to right. pull that away. Sampled so much. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, right. So for mine, uh, I had actually just come across this guy um, because I am obsessed with uh, James Wan. Um, of, uh, he's the gentleman that's this generation's Alfred Hitchcock. I'm sorry, I've said that on so many episodes, so many episodes, but you sure have. I have, I have. I, I got a, <laughs> I got a bro crush on the guy. What can I say? Um, I he's the gentleman. He he did uh, Insidious, the original Saw, <laughs> the Conjuring series. Um, so he's they've come out with some, some stinkers, but you know, um, you know me, I'm I'm a sucker for a horror movie with a solid storyline, really in depth developed character arcs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not just jump scares. You know, and I've always said that with horror films which are one of my was one of my favorite genres it's not it's not about the blood and guts and the gore jumping out which makes it scary it's the element of your imagination wondering what's waiting for you in the dark right and that's what scares the crap out of me um and there the gentleman that did um that did in cities the contrary his name is joseph bishara um and while i i, I guess i wouldn't consider I don't know what you guys would 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 think of uh, horror composers um, with a lot oh, of his, I love it. with with a lot of his yeah that's great with a lot of his scores, um, it's I know it's a lot of it's it's it seems it's kind of simplistic at points you know I mean it's it's a lot of strings here and like you know the the off key piano keys maybe an organ you know here and there um, maybe a couple <laughs> uh, like high you know high pitched uh, alto sections or soprano sections singing or something. Um, you should make that video I was talking lift. about. You should make the video of, yeah. of trailers, of trailer music. You should make that, a, the horror that movie version. Cool. I think we'd probably get a lot of hits on that. Actually, um, he's he's just so out of out of all the horror movies I've ever seen. And John Carpenter, his and and I think uh, Paul, you had brought that up. His his composer, I, for, I don't recall who it was, but I think they both were probably the best in that genre at setting up for the scare. And then when you think it's going to come, it does not come, and it holds you a little bit longer, and it builds the anticipation. And when it does come. It just, I mean, you, you jump out of your or, seat, you shit your pants. Go ahead. John, yeah, John Carpenter, comp- I mean, he scored yeah, most he, of his own films. Oh, did yeah, he, he score was, most of his? He was okay. a composer. Oh, wow. Okay. And well, Alan Ho- Howarth was his, uh, was, is that his name? Alan Howarth yeah. was yep. the other? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, what I look for when I, when I look for the, you know, the underrated is I'm kind of looking, just for me personally, I'm, I'm looking for somebody that could branch out into other genres if they wanted to. And some of the elements in these these James Wan horror films that I'm seeing him and Bashara collaborating on, I see the potential for a fantasy film. I see the potential for a um, even a period romance. Um, you know, I, I see I see the different. Although I I'm not I'm not like you guys. I'm not I'm not or unlike you guys. I don't have that prior knowledge of you know oh these these scales here these pitches here um you know i mean i i, I sang for a listen long time, to that so. octave isn't yeah. that beautiful yeah, it is yeah but um <laughs> i can pick pieces out in songs and i'm like okay this would i feel like this that's would a fit note good here yeah yeah that's a note yeah that's a c sharp that's a yeah. thing right they're at a rest okay yeah. cool <laughs> that crescendo there and day crescendo there yeah. that ladder got softer <laughs> um yeah, so yeah, so I, I guess for me, um, yeah, I guess for me, I'd, I'd have to go with Bashara. Um, so as far as let's let's jump over to we'll stay with composers. Um, I'm interested to hear everyone's overrated composers, and I know it's difficult. I'm sure this this was probably at least for me this was the most difficult one to find. Um, I had to go back and listen to a lot, and even my so, my one pick that I finally came up with, I'm still not super sure on it. Um, but Gary, I want to start this one with you. You know, um, I, I who, who uh, do you think you would throw out there. You can just I, be one if you want. Yeah, I mean, like I I couldn't really find one that I thought was overrated. You know, um, I think that um, you know, as we talked about earlier composers aren't really known like you know you, you don't really know who makes you know I, yeah i could be like i really hate the thwomps and like you know transformers you know the thwomp um but i, I don't know who skrillex. did that yeah skrillex did it skrillex. Oh, i really hate skrillex john skrillex he's <laughs> an <laughs> asshole <laughs> he didn't. um oh, fuck like, that guy no kidding yeah, so, so like <laughs> in, unless you know uh you're You know, for most people who go see movies, I don't think you're going to have like an over. I I get Randy Newman. Yeah. 
Randy Newman. <laughs> Not Randy Newman. Uh, uh, Thomas Newman, the gentleman that. No, no, no. That, who, like, did, who did the Toy Story song? That's Randy, Randy, Randy Newman. Newman. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was was that Paul Newman? No, I'm kidding. Oh, but it's some sort of Newman. <laughs> what are the Newman? Old, Lemonade. Old Newman. Lemonade. Yeah. Uh, was it was it Newman <laughs> from Seinfeld? Or? Yeah. Okay. Newman. Uh, yeah. I'd say Randy <laughs> Newman. Um, I mean, he's just <laughs> like I find his songs annoying after a while. <laughs> Randy Newman. I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, I hate you, Gary. I know. I know kidding. you do. I'm just kidding. I, I do get a little teary eyed when I hear "I Love L.A." Though I kind of love yeah. it. Yeah, that's not to a film. That's just a pop I've song. I've never been to right? L.A., so I can't love it. That's true. You do. Oh, you live in Austin, so it's true. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Did you say there's something been about to LA hearing that song here been. that's kind of like what happens to like my you know what used to happen to my grandpa when he heard like uh, "Star Spangled Banner." I hear "I Love L.A." I get all mm. misty eyed. It's great. Oh, nice. <laughs> I do love L.A. as well. Well, I would, I would hope so, since you guys are both yeah. in that area. Louisiana <laughs> yes. is great. It's got crawfish, you know. It's got a really uh, Creole culture. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about Los Angeles. Oh. Yes, Gary. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you've lived in Texas for too long. <laughs> womp womp. I'm gonna put in that. Pr- I'm gonna put in that Price is Right sound effect in post, where it goes womp 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 womp. <laughs> come on, you get, get on your get on your podcaster game. Get all those sound effects in there. Yeah, yeah come on, come on, Gary. We, we, we do those in post. Womp 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 womp. Like Howard, Howard Stern level. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the slide whistle. Uh, Paul, let's go to you. Uh, what, who, who do you think is the most overrated composer of all time? I'll keep this really short and sweet, but I put sure. down Danny Elfman because I oh, honestly, okay. I, I've heard look, that. Tim Burton was term, Tim Burton was a thing in the eighties and the early nineties, and then he kind of wow. lost it to me after Ed Wood. He did. And he really I, did. Every time I watch anything after Ed Wood, I'm just like, this sucks, and this is lame, and I'm sick of Johnny Depp and yeah. and Danny Elfman's yeah. fucking scores. I mean, I'm a I'm, I, I don't like to talk shit about anyone, but I, I say Danny Elfman. I'm kind of done with Danny Elfman. I think I could go 25 years without hearing Danny Elfman and it'd be perfectly fine. That's Fair it. enough, man. Fair enough. Seriously. Jimmy, how about you? <laughs> um, I'm just going to say piano and strings. <laughs> nah. okay. All right. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. Taking the easy way out. He doesn't want to start a war. I understand. I got you. I have a person in mind, but I, I just, oh. I, this is, oh. yeah. I, okay. I, I, I don't, I don't really want to. I don't know. I don't think anybody's really. Ah, uh, yeah. Overrated. Okay. okay. Fair enough. I'm gonna okay. say, I'm gonna say, piano and string scores in, in general, in, 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 as a whole just as a only as an only thing um and then and then also just like the thumping drums um that too i'm gonna say those things are overrated and they need to and i'm just, and i'm tired of it okay yeah. okay um i i even with this one i'm still still a little hesitant but it whatever um i'm gonna have to go with uh alexandre i think Desplat. alexander Desplat. Ah. yeah Desplat. um and the reason i was that thinking I, of him too actually but you know the biggest and i thought thing about for, the grand budapest and i thought that was great see i i love i i it's for me wes anderson films are hit or miss it depends grand budapest is fantastic True. um fantastic mr fox both good um and it wasn't that the scores in those weren't well done and it wasn't that they were that very that very quirky lighthearted kind of obscure sound that you come to know from a Wes Anderson film I just feel like when a for me at least when a composer gets in with a director it's like Danny Elfman it's like what what, to piggyback off what Paul was saying um, when they stay with that one director for too long you start to hear a lot of the same thing do you feel and, that yes. way for cinematography though? Like with um uh who did Tenet? Um Oh the, the D, his DP for that. I, yeah. yeah, we were just talking about that in another podcast. Um But uh, yeah, they they I'll look it up later. But. Yeah, but they they've been doing like tons of like is it audio is different than vid- visual for you? For, I'm a very I, I mean I, I am a I'm a very visual right. person, but the audio for me, it really does make or break the film. Okay, so, so you notice so. the the repetitiveness of the audio Absolutely. more than you do the, the yeah. visual. I I can pick up in I can pick up in a certain scene. I'm like, oh, that's that's the same. You know, that seems to be like the same 48 bars that I heard in another film that he did. Right. You know, o- over here, and it kind of makes me think of that film, and I kind of lose my focus on watching the movie for a couple of seconds, and I'm like, oh, okay. wait, no, I got to focus again. That's interesting. Um, okay, and that's just for me. But with this plot, he had done. Um, 
I uh, so the, there's a movie called The Golden Compass came out a while back. Um, I was a big fan of the book as a kid, and I saw this movie. It was absolutely horrible. Uh, it was just com- just complete trash. Didn't didn't stick to the novel close enough, in my opinion, um, at all. But the a fantasy score, I don't feel should be that difficult to mess up because there's so many wonderful examples of epic adventure scores over the last 70 years. If even if you don't listen to John Williams, try somebody else, you know, um, I mean, there's, there's ton, you know, listen to, listen to uh, anything, you know, uh, Howard Shore or, you know, James Horner's done, you know, um, just some of the, some of the other big guys. And it was that one in particular. And it's funny, I actually found a blog on it too. Um, that it just, it never, the score never, it never drew attention to itself. It was kind of like one of those songs where you just, you're kind of listening to it for five minutes to, I could listen to it for two hours and I, I wouldn't know, I could keep working and not know if the song ended or not because there was no point that it pulled me in. It was just mm-hmm. flat. And I don't know, I don't really know how else to explain it better than that. But, uh, you know, for, for him, I still, I still like some of his work, but I mean, he'd have to be the one that I, the only one yeah. I could find. Um, so so okay so let's move on the year that he won an oscar the for the shape of water right i thought that was like really that was a great one yeah yeah. i i i i I, I don't i'm not familiar with it but i do know that johnny greenwood was uh, i think for the phantom thread that was yeah is that the movie where she banged the fish right yes okay fish man yes all right great movie i know you i know you love that (laughs) that that was i know you love gilmore del toro yeah um, and, but I mean, that's the same thing. The, the score for that one. And I can't, I, I do recall liking it. I can't remember the exact songs from it right now, but just right. like grand Budapest, they were, they were both fantastic, but yeah. I, I look back at golden compass and I, I look back at, there was a, another list I'd have to go through again, but I was going through and I was like, yeah, I, I didn't really care for that one. I, you know, I'd look them up on YouTube and like refresh my memory. And I was like, oh yeah, that, that was okay. It kind of sounds like fantastic mr fox you know or, or, or grand budapest or something um so <laughs> kind of segueing into most underrated scores or soundtracks of all time are there uh kind of what do you guys think are the most not even influential just the one that you know it's like the composers ones people don't talk about um so uh we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll work it back around uh, so jimmy let's start with you um is there one or two that that really pop into your head that um you know, you even recommend to people to take a listen to, you know, maybe they're not, maybe it's not super popular. Uh, Team Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> I, noticed you've been, I noticed fantastic. you've mentioned that one a lot tonight. That's a good plug, man. Yeah. yeah they're not, no, they're but not it really is. It really, like if <laughs> way it starts, it's so good. It's such a good, it's, oh, it's so good. I don't know why, but like, I just, I, I don't know. My, it, it's so good. I really love that score. Um, um, underrated to, um, Man, again, I feel like I'm in the same kind of, uh, um, I guess, well, no, I guess these guys aren't really getting totally, um, you know, known for this, but um, I feel like um, Bobby Krillick or our Mm -hmm. artist name, Hacks and Cloak for Midsummer. um, Mm -hmm. Midsummer was a fantastic score. Love that Um, one. Yeah, so good. The way it starts is that long, eerie just violin string the, that just slight pa- pastel colored horror film yeah it's so it's so good um also colin stetson for hereditary um i think that yeah. was also excellent jeff barrow and ben salisbury are doing great things too um they're not quite the the duo as trent Reznor and atticus ross are but they're like ex machina and um yeah what was the um annihilation they did too um yeah, yeah the natalie portman one. fantastic um or for ozark even the netflix show was really oh. great um what's that name danny there. look at it's danny oh, bensey and uh, saunder i don't know what else they've done um but that's a so, great yeah. one handmaid's tale too i think that's like the only mm-hmm. score that that guy's really known for um he's been doing it's fantastic um i mean others like that are getting their their due now um Right. It's like Hild- Hilder and Gudna Daughter for Chernobyl and Joker. Um, you know, she's mm. killing it. She's doing great. Oh, she's she's a yeah. genius. Yeah. I forgot about her. And she worked under Johan. She was um Johan's cellist. Um, and so when Johan passed, she took she did Sicario too. Cause Sicario, I mean, oh. uh, yeah, yeah. Again, Sicario is one of my 
I, I think this is a question that we're gonna be talking about later. Um, but that's one of my one of mine things. But um, we'll we'll talk about it when we get there. Um, <laughs> Great. Movie. But um, yeah, I guess a lot of those. Um, Max Richter too. Um, I feel like mm-hmm. is is maybe underrated. I mean, I know he's pretty successful, but the leftovers, I feel like was such a great, um, both series and the music for that was just fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, that's a handful of handful of things. Yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't see. That's the great thing is that I love how you guys actually have that, that knowledge. Cause I, once again, love a lot of that, that mm-hmm. content, but I didn't know who the actual composers were. Uh, Paul, how about you? So the, this is for the uh, underrated soundtracks. Yeah, for the underrated soundtracks. Yeah. So you know, I, I put down. I, I've got an interesting little draw here. So okay. I mean, the Italian group called Goblin. They did the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Movie, Dawn of the Dead and Suspiria. All, a lot of the Lucio Fulci and Dario Argento films from the seventies and early eighties. The, the two thousand thirteen remake, right? The, that Tom well, the the, Tom York me, did um, that one, but. I was yeah, no, that no, no. Um, so Goblin did the soundtracks to all those '70s Italian films, but so I would say gotcha. Goblin's uh, score for Suspiria tied with Tom York's score of Suspiria. Yeah. I think that Tom York should have got a lot more. There, there should have been a little bit more attention to that soundtrack, and you know, people not enough people know about Goblin. I mean, that's such a silly name for a <laughs> a group that composed all these really classic European films, but. I mean, I find myself going back and listening to both of those soundtracks to the same film. I have them Re- both on vinyl. Yeah, remakes yeah. Of, of the same film. And I mean, yeah, it's, to me, those are just like neck and neck. I, just, I love both of them, and I, I feel more people need to hear it. Perfect, man. Uh, Gary, how about you? Uh, for underrated uh, soundtracks in film, um, I, I really like the soundtrack to the movie Patton, which came out in 1970. Uh, Hell yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, I guess the sound would be considered kind of dated now because it's a lot of trumpets and horns and, you know, it's it's been been parodied a lot in comedy films. Whenever they have someone who's like overly militant, they'll have that, that horn. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) Or uh, police Academy. I think that was their theme song as well. Police Academy and the burbs. They, 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 uh, (laughs) they they spoof Patton in that movie. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, I, I think uh, Patton really had a, a good uh, soundtrack to it. Um, it was popular when it came out, but that's been now 50 years or so. So uh, giving it a little shout out to that. Um, and for a more modern film, I thought um, Cloud Atlas had a really good soundtrack to it. Um, it was really? Th- uh, did, did you not like Cloud Atlas? I, I never saw it. I, 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 and that's one of those films I had that's got like a weird cult following now, even though when yeah. it came out, it it bombed, yeah. Well, it, it was the biggest budget independent film ever made. I think it was like $150 million wow. or something. Um, How's that even categorized as an independent film? Because it wasn't crazy. one of the major studios. R- right, yeah. yeah. I was just, I was just oh. like, I'm surprised. Yeah, that. you wouldn't. But um, uh, I, I think they had a really good soundtrack because the, 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 the titular song in it, uh, Cloud Atlas Symphony, um, I don't know if that was a real symphony or not. Uh, but it's, you know, kind of composed and the uh, music sort of uh, finds its harmonies throughout. Uh, it, it's a complicated story, but it finds its <laughs> harmony in each of the um, iterations of the 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 movie, because it's like about five different stories kind of not concurrently going, but uh, thematically concurrently going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I would recommend you watch it if you if you haven't there. You, you, I will. You, it's on my you, list. You, yeah, you've been telling me about it all these years, and I've just never had given it the time of day. Maybe I'll have to change my mind. Maybe. Um, for, <laughs> you know, for mine, I don't, I don't know if it 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 wasn't underrated back in the day. Um, mm-hmm. but I think if people forget about Max Steiner and just the amount of the amount of work that he had put in. Uh, you know, in the in the forties and fifties and such, and uh, the the sound the score for did Cos- he work Cos- with uh, Friedrich March at all? <laughs> I don't know if you were the Friedrich March. Friedrich March was in the 30s, though. Remember? Oh, yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah. That's a that's a throwback to another episode. Um, but Max Steiner did. Uh, he did Gone with the Wind. But okay. Casablanca in particular yeah. is uh, which I'm that's your favorite wow. film. So I'm surprised yes. you didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you don't know composers. I, that's true. This is true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, Apologies to all point. you composers out there. Um, but no, just even, no offense taken. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
but even from uh, even just from as time goes by, like even outside of that, just from from the opening sequence to the very end credits, there's just not a moment where I felt the music that he had put into place was not meant to be there. It didn't seem odd to me. Was, Nothing was out of place. And I'm sorry. What was as time goes by written for Casablanca? I do know that I do know that Max Steiner had begged them had begged the production company to drop the song from the film score but he was overruled yeah that was a good choice um, on yeah, I, the I don't, I don't, studio's I, part yeah, yeah that's right I, I don't know if he wrote it directly okay. or not um i have no, i don't know i'm not sure that's a good question i'll have to look that up and we'll put that in our in an edit um but i i yeah I, i'd have to i'd have to say that one that one has has always been that's one's always been one of my favorites for sure um and then god I don't want to. I've got a whole list. I want to go through all of them. Um, I mean, it, you know, it's funny you had brought up Thomas Newman, um, American Beauty's soundtrack. I just, oh, I don't feel, so good. Yeah, I know. And I, I don't feel like I've heard a lot of people, they talk about how American Beauty is overrated. And I, I've heard the arguments. I've gotten in debates, into debates with other people about it. That's fine. Everyone's got their own opinion. But it's just, it's just so, it's so pure. It's, it's our it, iPhone ringtone. Is it? Are you serious? It's. I mean, it's not, but it's. It's. Oh. It's. <laughs> dun, 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 yeah, dun, dun, you know, it's right. like that's that whole. It's. It is that vibe, you know. Yeah. And it's a marimba. Um, well, not a vibe, but yeah. It's. 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 It's definitely. I feel like that. That score definitely changed. Um. It was. It was a standout. It was a, it yeah. Absolute standout. I actually, could, I guess, I could have also saved that one for uh, for most iconic and and inspirational, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, monumental soundtracks. Um, but it's just, it's the same thing that w- I was talking about with the opening credits for Psycho. It, it tells a story, just like Casablanca's score tells a consistent story throughout the entire film. If you, I feel, if you just listen to it in one sitting, you could imagine a story in your head with no dialogue, with no sh- with no film shots, nothing. You could just feel the story and you could feel it out it may not be the same story but pretty similar all right um so for our last one this, for, is that scores or soundtracks you know because like that's that's another thing that's uh it was making me think mm-hmm. because like soundtrack soundtrack could also be like the placement of like actual like because a lot often when you buy a soundtrack it's like the the songs like the breakfast club mm-hmm. soundtrack or something like that right um or like stranger things soundtrack is different from the i've been score, keeping the you know, score like jimmy i think there's another episode that maybe we should be guests on that's all about the soundtrack right because yeah. that's that is a good that's one. A <laughs> that is a good that is uh, a good one guys hey if yeah. you guys want to jump if you guys want to jump back baby we'll have you let's do it let's run you, it back I, for did, a second episode did you ever watch um homecoming season the first season did you watch that show at all mm-hmm. homecoming no, no, I don't Home, think so. It's great because the first season of Homecoming um, is uh, all old scores um, used really? as a, as the soundtrack. So it's like it's got like John Carpenter, it's got um, it's got uh, Ennio Morricone, it's got um, like Clint Menzel, it's got Vangelis, mm-hmm. it's got um, Bernard Herrmann, and um, like it just uses all of these iconic scores as its soundtrack for the whole film for the whole um show the whole first season it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty cool Jeez. okay yeah you know what i i actually i've, I've heard of this multiple yeah it's on prime okay yeah the one with yeah. julie roberts and bobby cannibal okay god yeah i'll, I'll and I, then I, the I second season has a really amazing <laughs> i mentioned that earlier yeah and i think and i see that's that's the that's the crazy thing about about this this side of film is you know, we could go back in and we could just solely talk about the scores and the soundtracks for tv series yeah you know or or documentaries you know there's just there's right. there's so much yeah there's so much information there's so much content like out there. mash uh, that had a great song yeah, to mash it yeah very great friends theme song i'm totally kidding um <laughs> but <laughs> dun, 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 hey, you say what you, dun, dun, you say what you want it was a it was addicting just saying um and so another episode but, <laughs> yeah exactly so uh for our last one for the evening uh just for for time constraints unfortunately uh let's jump into most influential scores of all time uh so let's go ahead and we'll run it back starting with gary on this one uh gary which one pops into your head the most um can be whatever can be the most famous you know, john williams of I, yeah. all time or you can go a different route yeah well i i decided to take any john williams score out for this because to me that kind of He's in a class by himself. 
But so um, I, I I went with uh, Howard Shore's Lord of the Rings um, because I think that that uh, is super top tier. I think that the the way the the music is phrased and the way that it carries through and relates to each other um, is it just really fundamentally is part of those movies in a way that if you didn't have, you know, that exact score, you wouldn't have the movie be what it was. Right. And I, I don't, uh, I don't think that, I, I think that's a pretty rare combination. And I think that is a perfect example of this is a, a perfect mashup between what you're seeing and what you're hearing. Yeah, James Horner is also one of those guys that I didn't know about <clears throat> until a few days ago, but once I had heard and seen all the films they had done, I just, Yeah, he's done so much. I was I was it was just I was baffled. I didn't know what to say. I was like, I can't believe I didn't know who this guy mm -hmm. what his name was ahead of time. I know all these films. Um so yeah, I mean for for mine, it it's going to be another James Horner film. It's going to be Braveheart. I mean, I Okay, yeah. And it's it's oh. it's fitting that I had actually seen Braveheart for the first time when we were in Edinburgh um, for that yeah. theater festival, you know, for 14, 15 years ago. Um, I remember when we got off the train, we recited that entire, that entire Braveheart speech. William Wallace <laughs> opening the, the outside the battle of Falkirk. Yeah. Um, but it, it does such a wonderful job of pulling in the elements of, of romance and epic adventure and mm -hmm. inspiring a country to take back their land from the tyranny that had rained down upon them over mm -hmm. so many generations. Um, and it, it stayed true to its Scottish roots and you could see, you could, it wasn't even just, it w primarily was the bagpipes. Um, but he, he just, he just does such a good job at, at, yeah. Cause at like that had a really big range too. Cause you had, you know, kind of romantic scenes mm -hmm. in it as well as, you know, battle scenes, action scenes and yeah. adventure kind scenes of like betrayal. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, 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 that was, that's always been, uh, that's always been mine if we're excluding, um, John Williams and you guys don't have to, if you don't want to, but that, that would be for mine. Um, Paul, how about you? Um, I made a little list if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, for, oh, of course, by all means, man. <laughs> so Table is yours. For me, per me personally, the most influential, you know, as, as a musician and a, you know, filmmaker, and, um, number one is always going to be John Carpenter's Halloween. I mean, that I have. I've made records that sound exactly like that. I mean, or at least I'm trying my best to sound like that. Um, 2001, a space odyssey. I mean, all of Strauss's oh, yeah. you know, compositions in there, but I put a little mashup in here though, because you've got the 2001, a space odyssey soundtrack, but you also have that one particular scene in a Peter Sellers movie called being there where he leaves the house for the first time. And you hear the same Strauss track as he's walking outside for the first time, but it's, it's like a almost like a disco funk version of of um, I don't remember the exact symphony. I'll I'll, I'll send it to you guys later, but it's it's the same track, same song from 2001: A Space Odyssey. You know the main opening theme, and those two just had such a profound influence on me. And of course, I've got to mention Wendy Carlos. You know her. Tron oh yeah, and the Shining, Tron. and the Shining, the Shining and Tron and Clockwork Orange, and then yeah, Georgia Georgia Marauders, Midnight Express. I mean, there's a whole. I mean, he invented the 80s. To, to me, like with that soundtrack, because it's exact, it sounds like the 80s, but in the 70s. And it's it's the earliest form of techno and uh, dance pop. And he just did it to this really dark film, Midnight Express. And then John Barry's theme to the 1969 James Bond movie called uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Um, that it's it's like the, they discovered the Moog synthesizer for the first time and they they used it in a Bond film. And it's so influential to me. And then, of course, Ennio Medicone's uh, Once Upon a Time in the West and then Vangelis's Blade Runner. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was on my list, too. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Jimmy. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Jimmy, how about you? Uh, um, a lot. I actually, yeah, there was a, uh, I had The Shining um, on there, Wendy Carlos, um, and I had Vangelis, Blade Runner. Um, I also had The Godfather. Ooh, yeah. okay. Um, okay. How do we yeah. do that out? Nina Ro Rota. Um, Damn. I, I think that was a great, I mean, I, I, could go, I mean, it just goes without saying really how, like how powerful that, that, that music was. Um, whoa, what was that? Somebody that making a... music over there? <laughs> We're inspiring. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Was that your post? Drum. <laughs> my water bottle fell on my metal. Oh, culture. gotcha. <laughs> nice. Um, that one. And then, um, uh, I also had, um, 
to me, I feel like there was, uh, as I alluded to earlier, the um, just the the change of score in the last ten years, and 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 I feel like the people that kind of spearheaded that were um, Johan Johansson, um, Sicario. That that I don't that that score for me is a game changer. I feel like it just changed the scene, the like just the the, the landscape of of film music, um, as did Social Network from you know Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, um, and and. I think everything that 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 they have in common is that they are artists, musicians, like coming from the band world and coming into this and into this world of composing um, from yeah. a different angle. And I think that that's just been really, really important and has just changed. Um, and also, I do feel like they've also kind of pressured the heavy hitters, like the Hans Zimmer's and the and the Watts and stuff like that, to to, to do better um, and to change their kind of game up. Um, so I feel like that yeah those were game changing scores um they for me uh well unfortunately guys we are all out of time for tonight's episode um we we can't thank you guys both enough for for joining us yes um, it was it awesome was getting to talk absolute, with you guys absolute blast um hope you guys will come back again uh and do another episode on that was really, really anything fun. yeah yeah really anything it was just a, a joy to have on of course um so before we go um as as you had seen the itinerary we we uh, uh let our panel go ahead and give a recommendation to our listeners uh for the week maybe just a, a film to check out um preferably one that's kind of on topic um but if if there's something you really just want to recommend everybody you just watched or an all-time favorite by all means go ahead um so yeah let's go ahead and we'll, we'll let the guests go first uh so paul we'll go ahead and start with you um what recommendation would you give to our guests this week to take a gander at this is to- totally off topic but um the iron lady is a really good movie meryl mm. street plays uh margaret thatcher i've been watching that movie like nonstop for the last two <laughs> months and it, it's so good i can't tell you who did the soundtrack but everything about that film is like perfect okay yeah, I, 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 I think I've probably seen it four or five times within like the first two years. Of it Is this ship a threat? <laughs> Sink it. I, I just eat, so I eat. I eat a, anything Street does, dude. I, I don't care that she's. I don't care that she's. She's overplayed at this point. Say what you War want. movies okay. and that movie. <laughs> it's yeah. so good. <laughs> she's just. She's just, she's just an, in another, like John Williams, she's in a league all her own. Um, in fact, we were going to do a greatest actresses of all time episode because we did best actors last season. Um, so this season we're going to do greatest actresses. And we were just like, God, you know, between her and Catherine Hepburn, uh, I, I don't know, maybe we have to exclude them from the, from the entire. Nah. You know, I don't know, man. Yeah. They might, they might take a, might take a couple rankings home. Anyways, <laughs> uh, Jimmy, how about you? What would be your recommendation for this week? Um, you know, I haven't been watching many films lately just due to my uh, having two children during a um, pandemic being I can extremely exhausted. <laughs> um, but because of that, I do watch a lot of television series. Um, and I'm not, sure. and, and, and it just, is that okay to recommend? Yeah, that's great. To, we have tons of people come in and do okay. television series. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I May Destroy You on HBO is an incredible, incredible, um, incredible okay. series. And the music and the soundtrack of that of that show is incredible as well. I, I bet, man, I, I would certainly take your word for it over <laughs> over some of like yeah. Gary. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Johnny. <laughs> Just kidding, Gary. I love you, buddy. Uh, Gary, go <laughs> ahead. What's your recommendation for this week? Uh, my recommendation is a movie that I think, to me, best captures what uh, music and composition is, um, and. Neil had to jump off, but I'm sure I'm stealing his pick this week, as I always do. <laughs> uh, it's a film called Amadeus. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, it's oh the, a, the old, the, the, the yeah. OG? Yeah, nice. yeah with uh, F. Murray Abraham. Uh, it's yeah, because you dropped about, it earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's a story about um, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and uh, Soliati, who's another composer in Austria. And... Uh, it, it's a fantastic movie all the way through, but um, it's worth watching just for the last scene when Mozart's sick and he's dying in his bed and Salieri is there and Mozart is telling him to how to write the Mozart's own funeral dirge. Um, and you just like see the inspiration coming into Mozart's head from, you know, God above and Salieri's trying his best to, tr- to keep up with the notations. And that's just, it's a fantastic scene and a great movie. Yeah. 
I, I haven't seen it in a while. I'll have to check it out again. Um, mine for this week is actually going to be one that we we had brought up originally. Um, I just can't. I just can't not. I can't. I can't not plug it. Um, uh, there will be blood. Absolutely. For me. Um, I oh, rewatched excellent. it again a couple days ago. I hadn't seen it in about five years. And uh, just I, I, I was not really that big into Radiohead, honestly, um, before I had actually seen there will be blood in uh, I think 2008 2007 is when it came out um but once I found out that Greenwood was you know uh, I guess the, one of their guitarists or lead guitarists I was just like yeah I'll give him a shot and then it just changed my world you know in general um <laughs> but you know Paul Thomas Anderson he just has he has he's notorious for collaborating with uh, very outside the box thinking uh composers and, uh, you know, you, you to uh, Paul and Jimmy's point earlier, you know, that you guys were both talking about how you loved it when people did that. They broke down the barriers of the stereotypical music that goes in with a certain film genre. And I love that, too. Um, and with with Greenwood, it's just it's just eerie and it's complex and it just drives an already eerie storyline and it makes it even weirder and darker. And I just absolutely eat that up. Um, and also you know daniel day lewis performance is fantastic yeah uh, but yeah there will be blood is is my recommendation for this week um yes yeah uh, our co-host neil had to had to get off uh had a had a uh, little family thing he had to take care of there but he will be back with us next week gary will be back with us next week i'll be back with us next week and uh jimmy and paul we hope you guys will be joining us here as soon as possible love to have you back again um so for excellent so for myself and Gary and Neil and uh, Neil and Neil, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in to Lead Feather Productions podcast of I Don't Give a Flick. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast so that you never miss an episode. Podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts are hosted. I Don't Give a Flick is hosted and produced by Johnny Blackburn, Gary Elmore, and Neil Riley. Executive producer, Johnny Blackburn. Technical director, editor, and audio mixer, Gary Elmore. I Don't Give a Flick is a Leadfeather production. Copyright Leadfeather Productions 2021.